Hello everyone and welcome back. As always, I'm your girl Candy Washington and before we dive into today's Kiki, which is going through every detail of the new Vanity Fair bombshell article exposing Bravo and NBC and all of the housewives, we're going to go through every single detail but before we do, go ahead and like, subscribe, and share. Woo! All right, kitty cans, we are going to get into it. So basically, I'm going to go through the entire article. We'll read it together and we will stop and ask questions and have a fun kiki. Drop your questions and your comments in the chat box. All right. So here we go. A house divided inside the real housewives reckoning that's rocking Bravo. Amid disturbing allegations, Bethany Frankel's calls for a union and a whole lot of drinking, reality TV's most popular stars are facing their demons. All right, here we go. The housewife woke up in her own urine. She was still drunk from the night before. When she'd had three drinks at dinner, another three or four with her co-stars, then an indeterminate but debilitating amount of mescal after her castmates went to sleep. The house had been fully stocked when they arrived. She was too hungover to care that she'd wet the bed and so sick that she couldn't film, she told production. But people on set kept telling her she was fine. It was just the Mexican water screwing up her stomach. The same thing had happened to them in Cartagena, in Cartagena, Colombia the year before. The van hired for the day trip pulled over so the housewife could throw up. When the crew saw what was happening, they rushed over, she said, not to help, but to document it. Bravo didn't wind up airing that footage. Production did bring in a doctor who gave the housewife a shot. She pulled down her pants on camera and took it while a castmate held her hand. Dun, 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 dun. Quote, if you go to the whorehouse, you're going to get effed, said another real housewife. She knows what you think, that if you sign up to be on a Bravo reality show, you deserve what you get. And she agrees. If we do this, it's at our own peril. We know that and we don't effing care. They do it for the money in part, more than one million a season for the highest paid cast members, but it's more than that. The second housewife remembers being a little girl and plotting in her diary to achieve public recognition. Quote, I used to dream that one day maybe I'd, I'd get to go on Jeopardy and I would have put that in my obituary, she says. Now when she dies, she will le leave this mortal coil having been a reality star. She's grown accustomed to cruel comments about her body and face, vitriol about her life, but she has also become accustomed to the validation. I have been put through the ringer, she says, 100%. Still better than my worst day, withering away at a life of quiet desperation. When this housewife, speaking on condition of amenity, because she doesn't want to lose her nightmare of a dream job, went to last year's BravoCon, a three-day convention attended by 30,000 or so fans, she turned to two former Bravo celebrities and said, how do I ever be happy after this? This is the deal Bravo stars make with the devil, and there are many stars. There are currently 10 Real Housewives shows and about 20 other properties in the Bravo reality space, including the Emmy-winning Top Chef and improbable Emmy nominee Vanderpump Rules. The biggest series have 11 million viewers each. Network executives turned master of the ceremonies Andy Cohen host Watch What Happens Live, a nightly talk show on which non-Bravo celebrities and cast play games as Cohen polls the at-home audience with questions like, which real housewife of New Jersey has had the better nose job? Bravo, which is owned by NBC Universal, distributes the series on cable and via the streaming service Peacock. Shows are produced by third-party partners like um, Banna J and Warner Brothers Discovery. Advanced Magazine Publisher Inc., which owns Condé Nast, which owns Vanity Fair, owns a stake in Warner Brothers Discovery. 
Those partners have subsidiary production companies, including 51 Mines Entertainment, which makes most of the charter yachts franchises of Below Deck, and Shed Media, The Real Housewives of New York City and Salt Lake City, and all-star housewife show Ultimate Girls Trip, known as UGT. The production companies are on the ground during the filming of shows. The series and cast members orbit around Cohen, who described himself to me during a 2021 interview for New York Magazine as, quote, their boss, among other, other roles including, quote, father. It's an unusual employment arrangement in a singular workplace. If you watch these shows from the words Scary Island or Dinner Party from Hell or Amsterdam are a wormhole to the collective memory of a fandom. If you don't watch, it's easiest to think of these unscripted but highly produced series as the Bravo Cinematic Universe, an interconnected group of characters linked by Watch What Happens Live social media, and crossover series. The stars are usually affluent, often poorly behaved, mostly women who either know they're ridiculous or don't care if anybody thinks they are. As Lisa Shannon, Senior Vice President of Programming and Development at Shed has said, quote, this is a comedy. But the material is not always funny. Leah McSweeney relapsed after nine years of sobriety before her first season on The Real Housewives of New York City. Her recollection of a 2019 cast trip to Mexico, described at the beginning of this story, is from one of many interviews conducted over many months with current and former Housewives producers and Bravo staffers about the things that viewers haven't seen racist language and behavior, the real world effects of making entertainment out of destructive interpersonal relationships, the downsides of fame, and substance abuse beyond the meme fodder that drives fan discourse. According to some housewives, Bravo should answer for breaking them down for storylines. According to those who are responsible for the shows, however, the cast are largely in control of their own destinies. Now, with one of the most famous Bravo stars, Bethany Frankel, calling for a union, two legal complaints filed by talent in the last year, and NBC Universal releasing renewed guidance around cast behavior and production oversight, the Bravo verse is in the midst of a reckoning. I'm going to stop there for a second. Oof, 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 oof. Okay, this is the thing. And then, and then we'll keep going. When it comes to Leah McSweeney and her sobriety, I'm a little torn and I want to know what you guys think. Put your comments down below. Is it Bravo or NBC's Universal's responsibility to check her drinking because she was sober for nine years? Or is it Leah McSweeney's responsibility not to take a job where she feels pressured to drink if she's been sober for nine years. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, is it her responsibility not to take a job that puts her in that situation? Or is it the job's responsibility not to create those situations? I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence when it comes to that one. Kind of on the fence. Now, when they were talking about, you know, certain housewives who would drink and they would, you know, pee the bed and, and puke and black out and all of that stuff. Now, when it comes to that, I think it's the company's responsibility. I think it's NBC's responsibility, Bravo's responsibility, the production company's responsibility, because your, quote, employee is in, is in a harm's way on the job that you provided them with, and you are not seeking the proper medical attention for these people. Yes, they called a doctor, got the shot, but also when they're stumbling, when they're peeing, when they're puking, when they're fighting, you're still, the cameras are still rolling. So I want to know what you guys think about, you know, where does that responsibility lie? All right, let's keep going. Anyone who has watched reality TV since the real world first premiered in 1992 is at least partially aware of the normalization of televised intoxication. 
but alcohol has become a character itself as the lubricant that made the cast of Jersey Shore DTF and the bubbles that preceded a thousand bachelor tears. On Bravo shows, there are champagne rooms and fireball nips and fireball bottles and Belvedere and sodas served in short glasses with three lemons carcass out. There, there are nightly drinking games on Watch What Happens Live and weekly shot skis where Cohen and guests take shots off of, yes, a ski. During a panel at BravoCon in 2022, a Ultimate Girls Trip producer told fans that during filming, cast members Marisol Patton started her mornings with cockies, juice, and vodka. The audience loved it. According to one housewife, the cast stashed water bottles filled with clear alcohol around the set both to calm her, their own nerves and they hoped to get one particularly volatile cast member, quote, crazy drunk. She felt she felt like the producers hoped so, too. Quote, it's just faster and easier, the housewife says, of trying to give the producers what they want. Cast members describe some producers using big words, phrases written in large font on their phones, held up to redirect conversations. Former Real House of New York, Ebony K. Williams, says she ignored one that read, bring up Sonia's drinking, referring to Sonia Morgan, before a day of shooting begins. The production team sends out the beats of each scene, topics they've written and want it addressed. The following is a beat reviewed by Vanity Fair for an episode that was filmed in November of 2020. Quote, Sonia is on a loop and is on a loop and this abuse of pills and alcohol has been going on for way too long. Is there anything they can do or do they just need to be there for her when she falls? Okay, side note on this, all right? Because I'm going to try and be fair and I might be a little devil's advocate. This is the thing. When it comes to producers creating beats for scenes and trying to create storylines, well, yes, that's their job. You know what I mean? Like we're not watching a camera crew following people around just without any editing, without any narrative, without a storyline. It's actually not unscripted television. It's actually called scripted reality. That's what it's really called. So I'm not that up in arms about producers producing a show because that's their job. You need a beginning, you need a middle, you need an end, you need storylines, you need conflict, you need resolution, you need, you need to make sure that it makes sense for the audience, you know, for continuity. So that part, I'm okay with. I get that. The other part that is more problematic is I do agree that alcohol has become its own character, its own lubricant, it, its own feeling of, you know, every single scene, it's always let's do shots, let's have drinks, let's get drunk, let's get wasted, let's party. It is heavily, heavily, heavily um, promoted or encouraged for people to, to drink. Now, one thing I have heard that production does, which I think is wrong, is they'll say, oh, your call time is four o'clock. So you'll come at four o'clock and they'll be like, oh, we have to wait. Somebody's late. Drink. So then they have people drinking without food for hours. So then by the time they put the cameras up, the people are already drunk and ready to go. And then on top of that, they are drinking in the scenes. So I think that if production is strategically feeding people alcohol, strategically, you know, pushing back call times to, to get people drunk before they film, that I think is wrong. That I think is, is, is wrong. You shouldn't do that to someone. That's exploitation, right? That's to me, that to me is wrong. But I think also let's go back to talking about Leah McSweeney. I think when it came to her, I think she felt she had to drink in order to be cast on the show, right? And I don't think that's necessarily true. You know, this season on Beverly Hills, we have um, Kyle who is sober and she's not drinking on the show. We've had other, um, I'm trying to think of other people. We have other, we've had other housewives who aren't big drinkers and they drink water and they don't drink a lot. So I don't know if that was a self-imposed pressure Leah had on the show to thinking that they won't cast me if I'm sober, right? 
maybe, maybe not. But then at that point, you have to decide what is more important, you know, being on the show or my sobriety and my health. Very similar as well to a lot of the housewives being exposed for either being in fake relationships, you know, paying people to say that they're in a relationship or whatever the case may be, or being separated and lying and saying they're still together, or, you know, their person their person is dipping it and doing it and cheating and they have an open relationship and they're fronting for the cameras like they're in this happy relationship when we all know they're not. Or on the flip side of that, very similar to what's happening with Uba and Jenna on The Real Housewives of New York. They actually are in relationships, but their partner doesn't want to be on the show. But instead of saying, I'm in a relationship and my partner doesn't want to be on the show, they lie and say they're single because they think if we tell the truth that we're in relationships, but they don't want to be on the show, then they won't cast me. I think a big problem is that there has been all of these sort of pre-described narratives, personas, caricatures of what a housewife is. And now we have housewives, old and new, just faking the funk, right? Doing anything and everything. Let's throw a glass, you know, let's scream and lie. Let's say these people are racist. This person's a homophobe. This person's gay. I'm in a relationship. I'm not in a relationship. I'm wasted. I'm this. I feel like the problem is that Housewives has devolved basically into a caricature of itself. It's no longer rooted in any type of truth. Not that I think that reality TV is you know, God's honest truth. Obviously not, you know, it's it's scripted reality, but it's gone so far away from anything that's real. People are just showing up and playing characters at this point. You know what I mean? It's not even really rooted in anything. All right, let's keep going. And I want to know what you guys think. Put it down below too. When she was on Roni, Frankel adds, I was talking to producers about how we're going to bring into the show that Luann Delicep's fiance has cheated on her. A person with knowledge that Frankel acted on her own accord. Or a producer comes in and tells me that somebody is trying on wedding dresses when they're not engaged, and I bring that into a scene. All right, with this, I think that, okay, a couple of things with this one. The, I get Bethany Frankel is spearheading this, but she has to sort of own her piece in it because I think that the problem isn't just NBC and Bravo and their production and their pr production companies exploiting the talent, right? There's also the problem of housewives exploiting each other. Housewives have done each other dirty. Again, because they think they have to be shady and exposing people and going at it and taking each other down, whereas it really should be them having a sisterhood and having fun and having kikis and laughing and going on trips and spending lavish money. Now it's all about, I'm going to expose you for being a fraud. I'm going to expose your husband for being gay. I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. So I think if, if, Bethany Frankel and these other housewives who are going after Bravo and NBC, they also have to look in the mirror and say, well, where did I participate in trying to bring other people down? You know, people's addictions have been exposed. People's families have been exposed. You know, for example, when Brandy exposed that Adrian had a surrogacy for her children when her own children didn't know that. That was way back in the day for Beverly Hills, right? When Kyle Richards told the world that her sister Kim was an alcoholic, that that was a big thing, right? And then when people are also lying and making up horrible things, like we what like what we saw with Potomac, you know, with Chris Bassett and you know, um, Jizzy Neck and all of that stuff going on, and Ashley being like, "Oh, I didn't feel comfortable with him," you know, making allegations about you know different violations that never happened. So if we're going to have a reckoning with Bravo and NBC, which I do think we should have, I'm not defending them. There also needs to be a reckoning with the, within the talent themselves. You know, Bethany has gone on tirades calling people everything, but a child of God, you know, she read, um, 
Luann for filth. You know, she did a black scent talking about the housewives of Atlanta. You know, she read Sonia for filth. So there needs to be a reckoning in general about what's going on. And, you know, and how come there was no accountability for what happened in Beverly Hills going after Garcelle's son with Bakke, right? There was no type of justice for that. Where was there wasn't even an NBC and Bravo didn't even do an investigation into that. And that again, that was housewife on housewife crime. So there needs to be a bigger conversation going on about everybody's accountability and what's happening. Because the housewives, to be honest, are just as dirty as Bravo and NBC when it comes to trying to tear each other down. Also, what about, you know, Melissa Gorga in Jersey and Erica Jane Girardi and other people, um, Diana Jenkins, whoever, who go after content creators who are sending cease and desist? The problem is that the rot goes so deep, right? They were never held accountable for trying to get content creators shut down. Bethany Frankel did the same thing. It was more about um, beauty TikTokers. She tried to get them shut down because they were exposing her beauty stuff, right? Where is the accountability there? So I think this is very one-sided in the sense of let's just blame Bravo and NBC and the production companies where, yes, they do have a lot of blame, but it's rotten to the core. And it's corrupt to the core. And some of the people complaining have also been rotten to the core and have done very questionable things to their fellow co-stars and to content creators out there. So that needs to be talked about as well. Okay. According to McSweeney and Williams, producers did not suggest court telling Morgas on set drinking, even as they instructed a cast members to discuss it. Whatever has aired on the show is reflective of her experience, said someone who is familiar with production. Shed's current alcohol policy states, We have always strived to depict cast members as being authentic on the show. Therefore, cast members and cast members only make their own decisions about whether to consume alcohol. Quote, hot sheets are production's daily post-filming logs. They describe on-camera on action and dialogue in detail, from cast spats to Ramona's dogs peeing on her floor. Cohen receives hot sheets for the shows on which he is a producer, including The Real Housewives and Ultimate Girls Trip. A person who works in production says they are written by the field team and distributed to the post-production team that uses them in the edit, as well as various executives at Bravo and NBC Universal. Off-camera interactions aren't discussed on hot sheets, but executives have become aware of certain complaints. Roni season 13 featured Williams, the show's first Black cast member, in 2020 and 2021, Singer's allegedly racial racial hostility and use of the N-word in conversation with a Black crew member during season 13 production were the subject of complaints within Shed Media, Warner Brothers Discovery, Bravo, and NBC Universals. Companies declined to comment on specific allegations. Of course they did because they probably are bracing for lawsuits. Ramona Singer continued to film after the alleged incidents. Has since been part in, and has since been part of two seasons of Ultimate Girls Trip and appeared on Watch What Happens Live as this story was going to press. When asked if she used the N-word in conversation with a Black member of production, Singer responded, never. Everybody wants a bag of crap to not be on them at all times, Frankel told Vanity Fair. The most successful housewife of all time would know. In July, she called for her former, former reality TV peers to unionize and directed them to legal resources. She described some of these castmates and crew as people I never would have given the time of day, who I judge through these toxic process, and who may not have a past I would normally respect, but who I have been, but who have been tossed away after being used like trash. As she put it, it's kill or be killed. First of all, Okay. All right. This is so problematic. I can't even handle it. Let's break this down because there's two problems. There's a lot of problems. The first problem is number one, do I personally believe Rona, Ramona Singa used the N-word? I do. 
I do. Ramona Singer has made it very clear who Ramona Singer is. Do I think that NBC, Bravo, Shed Media, and all of the other companies knew she said it? Yes. Do I think they shrugged and said, well, it wasn't on camera, so whatever, let's keep it popping? Yes. I believe the Black crew member. I believe the allegation. And I believe the powers that be didn't care. They didn't care. And they kept it rolling. They didn't care. I do believe that. Um, how? And I also want to say something that's also very problematic. Again, it's with Bethany. And I, I used to really like Bethany, but this quote that she has in Vanity Fair makes me really not like her. I'm going to read it again. She said, people I never would have given the time of day who I judged through this toxic process and who may not have a past I would normally respect but who have been tossed away after being used like trash. So, Be so Bethany, you basically just called these people trash. You basically just said that they were beneath you. You basically said you do not respect them and you personally, personally would not give them the time of day, but yet you want to be the person who, who is being their advocate. Come on now, come on. Th that's why I'm saying there needs to be a reckoning for everybody involved in the situation. You see, everybody involved needs a reckoning. I think there are very few and far between, quote, innocent people involved in this toxicity. Bethany is an innocent. The way she has spoken to other cast members, the way she has acted, and then she basically just said, I, I thought these people were trash who are beneath me who I wouldn't give the time of day. That's basically what she just said. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. All right, let's keep going. In May of 2019, nearly three years before she checked into a psychotic hospital, or I'm sorry, psychotic, a psychiatric hospital, McSweeney was auditioning for The Real Housewives. I'm drinking again, but it's fine, McSweeney41 says she told the producer. She says she had been sober for almost a decade up to that point, and she describes this moment as her first attempt to minimize her substance abuse issues with Bravo. The conversation moved on to McSweeney's apartment size, small for a housewife, and what she thought of the other cast members. On August 2nd, 2019, Lisa Shannon of Shed, of Shed called McSweeney to tell her she got the job. The next day, McSweeney says she stopped drinking. According to McSweeney, her contract was for $3,000 an episode. As a matter of policy, Shed does not comment on compensation. More than a month later, on an early September cast trip to the Hamptons, McSweeney began drinking again. I don't consider myself an alcoholic at all. I've been drinking for the last six months or so, and I pick and choose when I drink, she said on the camera that season. McSweeney now says she was trying to keep her relapse from becoming a storyline. McSweeney says co-showrunner co Darren Ward had warned her, quote, this crap is boring as hell, and you better turn it up. Ward did not respond to questions from Vanity Fair. McSweeney turned it up. She drank and drank and took off her clothes and wearing only a thong threw a lit tiki torch across Singer's lawn. She doesn't remember that evening because she was browned out, she says. But when the episode aired in April of 2020, McSweeney as Hurricane, Le as Hurricane Leah was instantly iconic. Again, with this, I, and I want to know what you guys think. When the producers say, turn it up, is it their fault that McSweeney then gets browned out and drinks and breaks her sobriety? Or should Leah McSweeney not put herself in a position where she hears turn up and she drinks her sobriety. My bigger question is not so much about Leah particularly, but I think in general, should these reality 
production companies, NBC, Bravo, NBC, all of these people be doing deeper mental health evaluations, doing deeper dives into people's lifestyles to see if they are mentally fit and competent and emotionally healthy enough to be put in these situations, right? And this is just my opinion. I'm not saying this is true because you know how they get, don't come after me, NBC. You came after me before and I'm back. So leave me alone. This is my question. Do I believe that their so-called mental evaluations and background checks on these people are genuine? I don't. I think that they have mental health people who will sign off on anyone that they want to bring on, if you get what I'm saying, right? Like think about, you know, like if you could you could get someone to say anything, but there's been too many people on these shows who have substance abuse problems, whether it's pills or harder drugs or alcohol problems or, you know, um, dealing with very hard to deal with mental illnesses, you know, um, personality disorders. There are so many of them. And it kind of goes to that saying, you have to have a certain personality for reality TV, right? So it kind of bakes into that. And my question is, are they doing legitimate mental health screenings for the people on these shows? And also, are they doing legitimate background checks? Why is it on every single franchise, basically, on every single show, Housewives and beyond, there is at least one person who is actively participating in some type of fraud or criminal behavior. Some type of fraud or criminal behavior going on. And I'm talking about all of the shows. On Southern Charm, you know, what was his name? Thomas um, Thomas Rattle Dazzle, whatever his last name was. Thomas Rad. He was... Um, what was he doing? He was doing like, you know, hard substances, some nose candy. He was also accused of, you know, um, being sexually inappropriate without people's consent, the nanny and other people. You know, he was also accused of all of this stuff, right? So on all of the shows, not just the housewives, there are people who are literally being accused of criminal behavior, and then on shows like The Bachelor and other shows against each other, you know? So what is really going on? Even on Love is Blind, the Netflix show, they have a case now where one of the members is saying that she was, you know, t taken advantage of in a sexual way without her consent on the show. It's rampant across all of reality TV. So that needs to be um, addressed as well. Yikes. McSweeney says that in April of 2020, during an off-air exchange on Watch What Happens Live, Cohen asked her, were you already drinking or was your relapse at their winery or on the trip? She told him she doesn't, dr she doesn't dry when filming again, hoping to de-emphasize it. She wasn't dry when filming began. Oh, I'm sorry. She told him she wasn't dry when filming began. So basically what she's saying is that she lied to Andy Cohen and said that she was already drinking prior to beginning the show. She believes he looked disappointed that at the exact moment of Mick Staney's re relapse wouldn't be documented on the show. During taping, of, during taping of season 12 reunion in August of 2020, McSaney says Quoen asked, asked which drugs she used during her active addiction. Though a Bravo representative, through, through a Bravo representative, Cohen declined to answer questions. Side note, Andy Cohen has also had has had allegations against him. Again, I'm saying these are allegations. These are out there on the Googler. People can Google them. This is not coming from me personally. When he had a falling out with Kathy Griffin, she came out and said that prior to Watch What Happens Live, and this is what Kathy said, this is not what I am saying, that he offered her some nose candy and that it's always going on backstage. 
you know, we all know that Andy Cohen loves, you know, the ganja or whatever, which is fine. It's completely legal. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's also been other people who have talking openly about illegal substances, you know, Vanderpump rules. Tom Sandoval is talking about doing shrooms and, and doing mushrooms on the show. Last time I checked, doing mushrooms is illegal. That was never checked, right? Also, don't forget about, you know, Xanax smoothies and a bag of pills and popping pills and doing this. Erica Jane admitted to abusing controlled substances, her prescription pills. She said, oh, I was popping all these pills and drinking, and that's why I cussed out a child. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there has been clearly documented instances of either alleged or people themselves acknowledging that they have done Ill illegal controlled substances with zero consequences. And beyond zero consequences, they are rewarded for this poor behavior. So that also needs to be addressed. The following season, according to McSweeney, Morgan was so inebriated that she vomited and urinated on herself on a different trip to the Hamptons. Whatever footage there may have been did not air. Sonia Morgan didn't respond to questions from Vanity Fair, and a source with insights says producers don't recall the incident. Someone documented in the hot sheet for October 22nd, 2020, that Morgan was, quote, continuously getting more and more out of control and drunk. In 2015, during a trip to Atlantic City, a Roni cast member told production that Morgan was too drunk to film and that a real intervention was necessary. Frankel staged one on, on, staged one on camera. It didn't take. Now, don't forget, they were on some trip. Remember when Sonia got so drunk, she um, slipped at the table and hit her head? And they and they called the paramedics to come and EMT came and they had to check Sonia to see if she had taken pills. This was right around the time Bethany's um, fiance, Dennis, had passed away from an overdose. Remember when Sonia was slurring her words and she said she had taken, quote, water pills for weight loss. And that's why she got so wasted. I've never taken water pills, but my guess is that water pills doesn't cause you to black out and slur your words and hit your head on a table. I don't know. I've never taken water pills. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But that is also extremely alarming. Right. Um, also, let's not forget about um, Luann. You know, she had, you know, her DU, not a DUI, but when she hit the cop in the hotel when she was like wasted and she had to do community service and all of that stuff, you know, when she was intoxicated and all of that. So there's that situation as well that's going on where there are so many of these, and I'll just say women, majority, there are, there are, there are the men too. Don't get it twisted. They're especially over there on Southern Charm and all these other shows who get blackout drunk and they fight and they do crazy things all of the time. They've talked about this Vanderpump rules you know, all the different shows. So there is a question of who is mining these situations? Like who's looking out for the well-being of the talent? Because at this point, it's not Bravo. It's not NBC. It's not the production company. And very, very sadly, it is not each other. And that's a big problem. What I was saying before, all of the housewives, they're, they're also looking for moments. They're looking for moments they're looking for storylines. They're looking for people to take down and to attack and to expose. So nobody is protecting anybody. And that's why we have a situation now where there's lawsuits against NBC and Bravo. There's Vanity Fair exposés. There are people who are going to jail. There are people who are going to rehab. You know, think about Taylor um, Armstrong's husband. You know, he unfortunately is no longer with us because he chose to no longer be here. You know what I'm saying? What about that situation? You know, when there's allegations of domestic violence going on as well. So there's just a lot. There's a lot. Let's keep going. McSweeney says the only time production intervened in her own drinking was when Singer and De La Seps complained to producers that McSweeney had been too disruptive while filming in Rhode Island. 
On the trip, McSweeney threw a martini glass during one dinner and ravioli at Singer during another. A source involved with production says if the cast is out at a restaurant, production pays the restaurant bill. On production trips, production stocks the fridge and pantry with requested food and beverages. McSweeney says Shannon phoned her and said, we need you to be lucid. And at Shannon's request, a mental health professional called McSweeney, although they did not mention alcohol. Now, if this is the case, is it enough to tell a cast member who is clearly spiraling, we need you lucid, and just to have a telephone conversation with someone who is a mental health provider, they're saying, or should she have been pulled? You know, when does it get to the point where production says, you're no longer a viable person to be on the show because you have these problems and because this is what's going on. You know, when did when do they step in and say this is you're no longer viable? And I also think a problem is this culture of drinking and exposing people and being the baddest behaved and throwing things and all of this stuff has been so glorified that they think they have to do this in order to keep their seat at the table, right? Okay, let's keep going. Other housewives recall similar experiences with mental health care providers referred by Bravo. They have an 800 number for Dr. Barry, one housewife says of Barry Goldstein, an off-screen psychologist who goes by his first name with Bravo clients. His website, realityshrink.net, notes he is also a board game designer and expert. Goldstein has called on me, has called me on many occasions as a check-in, says a housewife, which in her estimation feels like you're not doing what they want to do. Goldstein did not respond to Vanity Fair's request for comments. According to a source familiar with production, all cast members have access to mental health care resources. But this goes back to my point that I made earlier. Just because you have access to a mental health care provider does not um, mean that that mental health care provider is legitimate or impartial or is quality or has your best interest in mind. I'm not saying that against Dr. Barry Goldstein. I'm not maligning this man. I don't know him. I don't know who he is. So I'm not saying that against him personally. I'm saying in general. It makes you kind of think, is this mental health care provider actually looking out for me, the patient, my best interest, or are they trying to get me to fall in line so production can get the shot? Do you see what I'm saying? I want my mental health provider to be on my team, to have my well-being in mind, to not be, to be impartial, and that if they are partial, the partiality is to making sure that my mental and emotional and physical well-being is what is actually in play here. It sounds to me more like they're checking boxes and they're crossing T's and dotting I's so they can say we have mental health care providers, but the mental health that they are providing is working on production's behalf, not on behalf of who would be their patient if they're getting mental health care, right? It's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. During season 13, which filmed from late 2020 to early 2021, McSweeney was freshly sober, but she struggled with the isolation of COVID and her grandmother, who had been a key figure of support, was in hospice. The cast was about to take a trip to Singer's house in the Hamptons, and McSweeney texted Ward and his fellow showrunner, John Paparazzo. My grandmother is going to die any day now, adding that if the funeral happens while we are in the Hamptons, there is no way I can miss it. Sorry. Paparazzo responded, obviously hang in there thinking of you. Okay. This might be an unpopular opinion, or you guys might be thinking this too. But I have a real hard time with Leah McSweeney being a victim in this. 
I do. I do. It's very similar to, and I struggle with this, and I want to know what you guys think. Who would be a legitimate poster child for this cause? You know, what reality star, doesn't necessarily have to be a housewife, but what reality star would be a legitimate person for this cause? Because when I think about Leah McSweeney, I personally don't think of her as a victim of Bravo or NBC. This is what I really think about Leah McSweeney. I think Leah McSweeney wanted to be on reality television. And I think she was willing to sacrifice her sobriety in order to do so. And I think she was willing to do whatever she had to do or what she thought she had to do to be relevant on the show. And in this text message, she says, my grandma is going to die any day now. If the funeral happens while we're here, I can't miss it. She did not say, my grandmother is going to die any day now. I have to be with my family and be by her side. I will, I will be back when I can. Do you see what I'm saying? It's very similar to how Bethany came out with, um, what do you call it? Rachel as the first poster child with the, with the podcast, where I was like, again, Rachel, nobody asked you to sleep with Tom Sandoval. You were sleeping with him outside of filming. You know, you did the most all by yourself. So you are not the poster child for this. And I feel like neither is Leah. I feel like what happened to Leah was her own making. And I think Leah's pissed now because obviously she didn't do well on Ultimate Girls Trip, you know, and that goes, you know, she was on Ultimate Girls Trip and she was sober and they still casted her for that. So she can't say, oh, I, I didn't get cast because I wasn't drinking. Well, they cast you for Ultimate Girls Trip and you were sober then and you got to be on the show. You just did a poor job because your personality sucked. So I'm trying to think of who would be a really good example of the poster child for this cause, because I do think there is a worthy cause here. On the flip side to that, as I talk this through with you guys, you know what it is. It's not so much that I need a perfect victim because I don't believe in perfect victims. I need someone who's going to take accountability for the role that they played. That's what it is. I need someone from reality TV. It's not Leah McSweeney. It's not Bethany Frankel. It sure as hell isn't Rachel. I need someone to come out and say, listen, yeah, I did all these crazy things because I thought I had to, to be on the show. And yes, I wanted to be rich. Yes, I wanted to be famous. And these are the things I did. And I admit that I did those things because I wanted money and I wanted fame. However, with that being said, these are also the horrible things that happened. These are also the ways that I was exploited. These are also the ways that I was used. You know, these are also the reasons why we need to have residuals. We need to have true mental health people on, on staff, right? That's what I need because there's no such thing as a perfect person. Therefore, there's no such thing as a perfect victim. But I think where this doesn't land with me is the lack of personal accountability. You know what I'm saying? That would make this land a lot more. Because they didn't make you not be there for your family, Leah. You said in your own text message, my grandma's going to die any day. If we have the funeral, then I have to dip because I have to go to the funeral. If it were my grandmother dying, I would have said, my grandmother is going to die any day now. I need to go be with my family. And I would not have gone on a girl's trip. I would have went and been with my family. And I don't think she would have been punished for that. If anything, they would have had her chime in in a FaceTime. Oh, Leah, how are you doing? We miss you, blah, 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 blah. You see what I'm saying? So I want to know what you guys think. Put it, put it out there. Put it out there. Okay. Soon after the trip began, Messini learned her grandmother was losing consciousness. She began having panic attacks. A source involved with production says War told her, whatever day or time you need to be with your grandmother, we're going to make that happen. Don't get stressed out about that. We're on your side and we're going to support you okay. But McSweeney felt his tone meant the opposite. 
A car was later arraigned for McSweeney when she requested to leave the Hamptons a few hours early. Her grandmother had already died. Some fans questioned why McSweeney hadn't gone to her grandmother earlier. A thread Cohen encouraged on Watch What Happens Live after being asked by Cohen about McSweeney and the trip. Former Real Housewives of New York housewife Heather Thomas says, I think it was better for Leah to go home. It hurt so bad that I was not able to grieve, McSweeney says. That I had people not showing me any kind of compassion or humanity regarding it at the same time, McSweeney was trying to maintain a good relationship with producers and convince herself that what had happened in the Hampton was okay. She texted Ward and Paparazzo, I'm glad I stayed in Long Island because that's what my grandma wanted. McSweeney says reading the message now is like seeing someone with Stockholm Syndrome. See, again, that's what I'm saying. It needs to be accountability saying, oh, I had Stockholm syndrome. I don't buy that, Leah. I think that you didn't want to jeopardize your role on the show. You wanted, you know, um, thank you, Bab, so much for becoming a member. Thank you so much, sweetheart. Um, I think that you, she wanted so much to stay on the show and her relevancy and to have her moments you know what I'm saying? And to have her moments that in her mind, she chose not to do that, right? But there have been plenty of times when housewives have have left to attend to family business or emergencies within their family, and they weren't, you know, um, what do you call it, punished for that. So that's what I'm saying. There needs to be some type of yeah, these are the mistakes I made, and this is why I made them. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other horrible things happening. That doesn't mean that there aren't real issues that need to be addressed. Because this is life. You see what I'm saying? It's not a fairy tale. Things happen. People make mistakes. People mess up. People do stuff. It doesn't negate when other bad things happen right? But I want to know what you guys think. Put, put your question in comments down below. While the season was airing, McSweeney says Shannon told her, I just think that there was such a stark difference between you when you were drinking versus this season. And that's why the audience kind of didn't like you. A source says McSweeney co complained about the audience hating her, but her drinking was not at the center of these conversations. The source also notes that viewers found McSweeney's struggles to be relatable. Nevertheless, McSweeney informed Shannon of her decision to, le to leave the show by phone in late 2021. I, <laughs> I'm not trying to bash Leah, but I, I don't think it was Leah's choice to leave the show. Let me, I'm just going to put that out there. I think that's another Lisa Renna. I quit. No, you didn't. And this is another thing. Uh, again, I have to agree with um, the production side on this one. Speaking personally, I did not dislike Leah because she was drinking. I disliked Leah because she, to me, she wasn't a very likable person. She wasn't fun to watch. She wasn't authentic. To me, I felt like she came on the show ready to play a part, ready to play a role. I didn't think we ever got to know the real Leah. She came on the show acting like she was, you know, liberal and young and sex positive. Turns out she's very, very conservative. You know, not that politics should play a big role, but when you're pretending to be one way on the show because you want to be fake woke, but then it turns out that's not really who you are. That to me really didn't land. I never bought her storyline that she was converting to Judaism. That didn't make any sense. I didn't buy that. Um, I thought that she just wasn't fun to watch herself. I don't think it had anything to do with her drinking. I thought that her drinking and her antics to me was very performative, you know, when it came to that. So on when it comes to that, I do agree with them. I think it was her we didn't like. However, there have been other examples of people where we're what, like, for example, with Sonia, you know, since they brought Sonia up in the article, I did feel that it, I not that I didn't like Sonia because she was drinking. I'm not saying that at all. I did see that. Oh, wait a minute. There's something going on with Sonia because of the drinking, slurring the words, passing out, 
you know, popping the pills. There's there's something going on with the drinking. Also with Marisol on Real Housewives of Miami, I think there's something going on there. Like the article brought up with the cockies always being, you know, always drinking all times of the day and like having that be such a part of of who she is, of always drinking, 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 you know. Um, if you watch The Real House, if you watch um, Basketball Wives, Jackie Christie, she is always, always drinking. And I'm always concerned about what's going on with her relationship to alcohol, you know. Um, James Kennedy on Vanderpump Rules, he clearly has a problem with alcohol. Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules, she is sober and has been praised for being sober on the show, right? So, Again, with these people coming out, Leah, we didn't let, dislike you because you were drinking. We disliked you because of your personality on the show. Do you see? Okay. But put it down below. Let me know what you guys think. Weeks later, McSweeney says she suffered a major depressive episode related to the show and her grandmother's death. Her mother and a former long-term partner, the father of McSweeney's teenage daughter, moved into her home, then McSweeney to Silver Hill Hospital. She stayed for eight days, the longest amount of time insurance would cover. By March 2022, after many hours with a therapist, rabbi, acupuncturist, and healer, McSweeney felt she was in a better place. Bravo and Shed were casting a season of Ultimate Girls Trip to be filmed in Thailand in July of that year. McSweeney says producers swore it would be different this time, fun, and that she was offered $250,000 for one week of work. So she got a quarter of a million dollars for one week of work, okay? One week of work. Cohen, an NBC Universal executive, told her she was being considered for Roni Legacy, a Roni franchise with veteran NYC housewives that might air alongside a rebooted Roni series with a new cast. According to McSweeney, Cohen also said, let's get you through Ultimate Girls Trip first. McSweeney said yes. Okay, here we go. Like I just said, I do not believe Leah McSweeney called NBC Bravo, the production company, and quit the show on the phone, right? Because if she had quit, then why would they come back to her and say, oh, we want to get you on Roni Legacy. Oh, we want to get you on um, Ultimate Girls Trip. I'm confused by that. If Leah quit the franchise, why would they then come back to her and ask her to be on the franchise? doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to tell you this. Again, Leah, you saw that you were that you could make a quarter of a million dollars for one week of work. Call a thing a thing. I would do it too. I, and this is a thing. I'm not shading Leah when it comes to this. If somebody said, "Hey Candy, we're going to give you a quarter million dollars if you come and and hang out in Thailand for a week, sign me up. My passport is ready to be stamped. Let's go. I'm gone. I'm on the flight. Let's do this. Cameras up. Let's do it. Right? Who would say no to a quarter of a million dollars for one week of work? Duh. But say that, you know, and also say, you know what? I was in a psychiatric facility for eight days because I was so depressed over how I was, you know, portrayed over my grandmother's death, death on a TV show. But yet I was willing to go back to the same exact situation because Ultimate Girls Trip Housewives, it's the same situation, rinse, wash and repeat, right? To the same exact situation that I am claiming landed me in a psychiatric hospital for a quarter of a million dollars. You see what I'm saying? If you really felt that you were in a psychiatric hospital for eight days and it was so horrible, why are you now agreeing to go back to the same situation that allegedly put you there in the first place for a quarter of a million dollars? You know, that's what the article says. I'm reading directly from Vanity Fair. It said, I'm going to read it again because this is cuckoo for cuckoo puffs. Dun, 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 dun. Where is it? Stockholm Syndrome, blah, 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 blah. It said, McSweeney says producers swore it would be different this time. 
fun and that she was offered $250,000. We, we can do the math. That is a quarter of a million dollars for one week of work. That's why she came back. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I would hang out with pretty much almost anybody for a quarter of a million dollars for one week in beautiful Thailand. But yet now she wants to talk about her trauma. Come on, girl, bye. Girl, bye. McSweeney got a text from fellow Ultimate Girls Trip cast member Marisol Patton before filming began. I support your sobriety, obviously, and I could never do what you do because I don't have your willpower, and I marvel at what you have done, Patton wrote. And then, but on that note, I wish you were still drinking, that's all. Yes, I sent the text message Patton told Vanity Fair. There was a collective memory of the girl running around throwing tiki torches and skinny dipping, and that is who I was hoping to go on vacation with. Okay. This is the thing with that. How is that anybody's fault? Marisol herself, in my opinion, I'm not uh, allegedly, just, just from what she shows and what she said herself, she doesn't have the willpower, she can't do it herself, has a very questionable relationship to alcohol. I'm not saying anybody's an alcoholic. That is not my place. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying based on what she shows herself, drinking from the day she, the moment she wakes up to the time she goes to bed, having basically ulcers on Ultimate Girls Trip due to drinking and not eating. Um, again, this is all on the show. I understand why someone who has their own questionable relationship to alcohol would say to someone who is maybe sober and maybe this person wishes they had that strength, like she said, hey, you know, I wish you were drinking because it kind of shines a light on their own stuff. To me, this would only be relevant if Marisol said, yeah, because production told me to say that to her. Then we're talking about culpability. Then we're talking about exploitation. Then we're talking about setups. Then we're talking about a problem. But if Marisol herself just said, hey, girl, you know, I'm happy you're sober. I can never do that. But, you know, gosh, I wish you were drinking because you were so crazy then. Okay, what's wrong with that? There's To me, I don't see a problem with that. That's when you say, ha ha, yeah, that's why I'm not drinking. I get too crazy. End of discussion. The only way this is relevant to this particular conversation is if someone from Bravo or NBC or production told Marisol to say that to Leah to make her feel like she had to drink. That would be where this is a problem. So until Marisol comes out and says that production put her up to that, I don't get the point of including that. Okay. Though McSweeney was vocally vocally sober, cast member Heather Gay asked McSweeney if she was drinking and she said, let's get Leah drunk. Another cast member, Giselle Bryant, said to McSweeney, like, if you drank this week, would that be a big deal? It would ruin my life, McSweeney said. Now, maybe I'm being a hypocrite on this one, but that's okay. I'm allowed to be. Where This is where I think, I think Giselle... <laughs> was trying to set Leah up, but that's just because I think Giselle is dirty like that. I think Giselle came on the show being a, a producer plant. I think Giselle came on the show with a job to do. If you watched Real Housewives Ultimate Girls Trip Thailand, the only thing Giselle did was stir the pot, ask probing questions, dodge any questions about herself, I do think Giselle was trying to do some type of okie doke setup. That's just my opinion on that when it comes to that, because that's who Giselle is. You know, why would you say to someone, would it be a big deal if you drink this week when you know that they're sober? Heather Gay also, I think, is just messy boots. But again, until they say production told me to do this, this goes back to what I said earlier in, in this breakdown, where I said it's not just production who needs to be held accountable, it's also the castmates to each other. Because if these castmates are going in on these shows, knowing somebody 
has um, a drinking problem, knowing somebody is struggling with their sobriety and is putting pressure on them to drink, then that is on the cast member and the talent. And that goes back to what I was saying. There is a lot of toxicity. The rock goes to the core. And there is a lot of people who are doing dirty. A lot of people who are doing dirty. I wouldn't be surprised if they did go on there trying to make a moment, trying to get her drunk so they had someone to talk about. Let's look at Leah being drunk instead of looking at me and what I got going on. They do set each other up. They do try to expose each other. They do plant stuff. They do stir the pot 100%. So is production dirty? Yes, they are. But so are the cast members to each other as well. Always looking for a takedown, right? So there's a lot of people in this situation that needs to take accountability for what they did. Does it make one wrong and one right? Just because the castmates are dirty doesn't mean that NBC and Bravo and production companies are clean. Just because production, NBC, Bravo are dirty doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that um, what do you call it, that the cast members are clean. To be honest with you, I think they're all dirty. All of them are dirty. Thank you, Juanita, for coming a new member. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So I want to know what you guys think. Put it down below. Okay, here we go. McSweeney texted Ward, did you guys push her, Bryant, to talk about the stuff with me? It's so odd. Ward wrote back, no, we did not. McSweeney texted, I don't need people trying to undermine my sobriety. Ward responded, get out of your head. During lunch at an elephant sanctuary, the cast played a game. One McSweeney says the producers came up with in which they listed the best and worst parts of being housewives. McSweeney taught, wait, side note. See, about the lunch at the, about the, the game, the best and worst parts. That's what I'm telling you, Giselle. And I also think Portia were producer plants because they were the ones coming up with all of the games and stuff. And they got that from production, right? Let's keep going. McSweeney talked about feeling like she couldn't leave the Hamptons and the depression and, and impatient treatment that followed. According to McSweeney, Ward and Paparazzo, the showrunners, came into her room and Ward said, Lisa Shannon's pissed at you. Then you're going to get it today. A source familiar with production's thinking says Shannon was not, was not unhappy, just confused by McSweeney's belated upset, as producers had told her she did not need to go on the Hamptons trip at all all. The cast began piling on McSweeney, according to people with knowledge, repeatedly telling her on camera that she didn't want to be in Thailand. In confessionals that aired, cast members discussed whether production would ever have pressured them to stay on a trip and not be with a dying grandparent. According to someone with knowledge, there was at least one dissenter, Gay, who said they wouldn't even have to say a word. I would be afraid to leave and go to my grandmother's funeral. I would not do it. That footage wasn't included in the show. All right, this is where I land on this. And I wanna know what you guys think when it comes to this whole situation. Leah McSweeney, shut up. I think Leah strategically was acting like she was so manipulated into staying and that she felt pressured to stay on the show because of her grandmother, you know what I'm saying? Um, and all of that stuff. And because of the backlash she got on social media, she was now trying to clean it up with that statement on Ultimate Girls Trip. But it's too late. You already exposed yourself with the text. You clearly said, my grandmother is going to die any day now. If the funeral happened, I have to go to the funeral. You never said, my grandmother is dying. I need to be with my family right now. Production even said, we got you thinking of you. Okay? So stop it, Leah. Stop. And I don't think that the rest of the cast were piling on Leah because she made that particular comment. I think they're piling on Leah because she was miserable the entire time. I'm sorry, but if you're paying me a quarter of a million dollars, I'm going to put a smile on my freaking face. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to try and get to know everybody. I'm going to have a good time. Doesn't mean I'm going to get blackout drunk. Doesn't mean I'm going to be wasted. Doesn't mean I'm going to physically fight anybody. Doesn't mean I'm going to try to expose anybody. I'm just going to show up and have a good time and be grateful that I am so blessed that I get to be in Thailand making a quarter of a million dollars. Lisa, not Lisa, Leah 
had a stank attitude the entire time talking about her period and everything else under the sun. She had a stank attitude and she didn't want to be there. She was barely even phoning it in. So the pe people had a problem with you, Leah, not because you said that you were pressured into staying in the Hamptons. People have a problem with you, Leah, just like on the show because of you. Not because of anything else. In the same way that she was trying to clean it up, claiming that she was so distraught that she didn't get to go, that she didn't be with her grandmother, of course the producers are going to ask in confessional, do you ever feel pressured by production, you know, if a family member is dying, because now they have to clean it up and protect themselves. And Heather Gay can miss me. Heather Gay with the like, it wouldn't be a question, I would be too afraid. That's what Heather Gay says to every freaking thing. Heather Gay, that's her, her, Heather Gay's personality is I'm an insecure, codependent people pleaser. That's her personality. She says that about everything. I'm too scared to go against Jen. I'm too scared to talk to Lisa Barlow. Blah, blah, blah. Shut up, Heather Gay. Stop. You know good and well if a family member was dying, they would let you go be with that family member. I'm not buying what you're what you're putting down, Leah. I'm not. I'm not. I want, but let me know what you guys think about it. Okay. Da, 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 da. Several days before Ultimate Girls Trip wrapped, McSweeney had a panic attack, which was aired. According to McSweeney, a staff medic gave McSweeney a makeshift IV clipped to a clothes hanger on the bed frame, which then fell and pulled the needle out of her wrist. When McSweeney's condition didn't improve, the crew took McSweeney to the hospital where she was admitted overnight. Two members of production were nearby, and McSweeney started crying to the nurses. Just keep them away from me, she said. In November, McSweeney found out from De La Seps and another cast member, Dorinda Medley, that Legacy would be filming without her. You think? You think? This is the thing. <coughs> I'm with production on this one. I wouldn't want Leah back either. We just gave you a quarter of a million dollars. You show up, you act and stink. You're lying on us about what happened before in the Hamptons and your dying grandmother. Then you're yelling at people in the hospital saying, stay away from me when you have when you allegedly have a stomach bug. Was Leah actually sick? I don't know. I don't know. And that's saying a lot because for me, if anybody says they're sick, my default is to believe them. I, you could be like, oh my God, I have monkey flu. I'd be like, you do? Do you want a hug? You know what I'm saying? Like, I believe people all the time, but do I believe Leah? No. If I was production, I wouldn't want Leah back either. A, she seems very weird to me, but also she's not giving. If the audience doesn't connect with her and they and you've been given multiple chances you get, were given the shot on Roni you you failed it you you weren't a fit on Roni you didn't land then you were given a quarter of a million dollars and a shot on ultimate girls trip and you came in like a freaking wet blanket and you failed there why would i then bring you on for another chance to show up and just be a miserable person that nobody wants to watch or have fun with I'm with production on this one. Again, they're not proving what they need to prove to me. But but I but that's not to say that I don't think that there's been very shady behavior by every party involved. I think Bravo has been shady, NBC has been shady, production has been shady, and cast has been shady. They've all been shady. Okay. On March 10th, 2023, McSweeney and her attorneys at Allman Matz filed an employment discrimination complaint with Equal Opportunity Commission against Bravo, Shed Media, and its parent company, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Cohen, Shannon, Paparazzo, and Ward, citing a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Leah, Leah, not the Americans with Disabilities Act. Leah. On May 15th, Christy Del Relicun, an attorney representing all respondents, denied the claims. The response stated that McSweeney's disabilities were allowed for and that she was not retaliated against. In fact, the response says production spent endless amounts of time accommodating her and 
her and only internally expressed frustration with the fact that she was no knowingly misrepresenting what had transpired. The attorney also pointed out that the complainant herself spent much of Roni season 12, the season of her relapse, discussing and sometimes even mocking the alleged disabilities that are now the subject of the instance complaints. And stated, complainant's need for affirmation was never ending, but that need was completely separate from any alleged disability. The response notes several instances of support, but McSweeney maintains those were either subsequently reneged on or she felt weren't offered in good faith. This is the thing, though. This is the thing. And this is and this is going to be the problem. Your assumption of someone's tone or good faith isn't grounds for what you're saying. They would have to have had actually reneged on what they said or they would have had to actually retaliated against you for what you're saying. You saying, like Heather Gay said, oh, well, I thought, I felt, it sounded like, well, maybe, doesn't prove what you're saying. Because people take things very differently, just like what, what um, the production was doing by polling the housewives. Do you feel pressure not to see a family member who's sick? Do you think you wouldn't be able to go? Five out of the six said, no, I would definitely go. And the six was Heather Gay, whose personality is codependent, people pleaser. And I think she fakes a lot too. She fakes that, oh, you know, I would be so scared. Oh, I would take anything. Stop it, Heather, stop, right? So if five out of six say, no, I didn't take their tone that way, then you saying, well, I took that tone that way and therefore I did something is not proof of the other side's negligence or the other side's retaliation. That's just proof that you assume something, whether true or not, and acted on an assumption, not a fact. And this is where they're messing up. All right, let's keep going. On March 23rd, Ultimate Girls Trip premiered. On episodes of Watch What Happens Live that aired during the run of the show, Cohen questioned guests about whether McSweeney was fun on the trip. One night this spring, Leah was Leah was the drinking game word. Whenever anybody mentioned McSweeney, Cohen instructed viewers to take a drink. Okay, that's fine. Who cares? Whatever. <clears throat> also, what's problematic about Leah is because you were not cast for Roni Legacy, Therefore, you did a lawsuit. But it seems as though if you were cast for Roni Legacy, you would have happily gone back to the franchise and to the show. That's like a meanie. Because you're no longer being cast for shows, now you want to do a lawsuit. I personally think Nini's lawsuit had more credibility than Leah's. But it's just the timing of the situation. Because I'm no longer in favor, because I'm no longer being cast, now I want to do a lawsuit. Where for me, it would be, I'm doing a lawsuit because this happened and there's no way I'm putting myself back in that situation. But eight, but after spending eight days in a psychiatric ward, you decide that you're going to go right back to the same place for a quarter of a million dollars, that's on you, boo-boo. That was a choice you made for the money. And honestly, I'm not mad at it. I would take the money too. Hello, anybody says they wouldn't take a quarter of a million dollars to spend a week in Thailand or must be like a billionaire. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not knocking her for that. I'm knocking for this sort of like, you know, retrospective anger and all of this stuff. Because I guarantee you if Bravo said, Leah, we'll have you back for the reboot. We'll have you back for Legacy. Leah would be right there on Roni right now without any type of lawsuit. And I also pretty much guarantee that if, if Bravo said, Nini will give you your own spinoff, Nini will bring you back on the franchise, Nini also would not have filed her lawsuit. She would have been right on her little spinoff. She would have been right on Roa. But I do think Nini's lawsuit had merits. I do think what she said was true. But I think the only reason why she said it was because she was no longer in favor. Whereas Leah, I think, is, is a stretch. 
I think she's making stuff up or exaggerating because she's pissed that she got fired. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Oof, this is a doozy, you guys. This is a doozy. Problem, uh, problem drinking isn't the only problem. That was immediately clear to Williams, a lawyer and TV host who in 2021 became the first black cast member on Roni. Many other cities had featured black housewives, though cast at that point were largely segregated by race. Beverly Hills, New York, Dallas, New Jersey, and Orange County were mostly black, or were mostly white, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Atlanta and Potomac, mostly black. A virtual education session before filming season 13 covered topics including, quote, black women, how black women are treated in larger society and the black community. Microaggressions, what are they? How do you recognize them? Lexicon, appropriate versus harmful events of language and missteps. How to do, what to do when you say something offensive? How do you move forward in that relationship? Williams, McSweeney, Morgan, Singer, and De La Seps were all on the call as well as an NBC Universal communications executive, a Bravo publicist, and two representatives from a racial justice organization. Williams had never previously met Morgan or Singer. Before the one hour session officially began, according to McSweeney and Williams, Morgan commented on the natural hair of black women leading the, le um, leading the session. Williams 40 interrupted the meeting as a cover your butt move she says it mostly focused on the kinds of things cast members should avoid saying, like the racist trope that Black fathers are not present for their children. What if they don't have a father? Why can't I say that? Singer said during the meeting, according to Williams. Most of them don't. The Roni publicist, who is also Black, told Singer that she has a father, but Singer said she'd read a study that confirmed that most Black children do not. McSini corroborates Williams' account. The training included open dialogue, Singer said to Vanity Fair. In that spirit, I asked a question about a statistic I had read about single-parent households, where children with single-parent households were statistically less likely to succeed than two-parent households. Later, while filming a scene that did air, Dela Seps and Singer expressed on camera their squeamishness around the words such as D-I, you know, K, which they attributed to their backgrounds as church-going and conservative. Williams said that she had no discomfort with sexual language, noting that she was the most educated person at the table with a BA and a JD. De La Seps, who is a high school graduate and licensed nurse, said, I don't like the way you talk. When Singer also got upset, Williams said, your white fragility is killing me right now, then had to explain the term. De La Seps called Williams an angry woman, which Will Williams understood implicitly as an angry black woman. I never referred to your color, De La Seps said. Williams left, Singer stayed behind. The scene that viewers saw ended there, but the emotional momentum continued. One of the people who remained told Vanity Fair, Ramona slammed her hands on the table. She goes, this is why we didn't need black people on the show. This is gonna ruin our show. Singer emailed Vanity, Vanity Fair, this is absolutely did not happen. In fact, I supported adding the adverse cast members well before Ebony was at it. The hot sheet went out several days later to a group that included Cohen and other NBC executives. It did not note, however, that Singer allegedly said the show didn't need Black people. On October 24th, 2022, Cohen responded via email, these are incredible reads and will be amazing episodes. The fact that this particular journey through right fragility ends with Ramona DMing Brian Cranston is next level. Okay. All right, a couple of things. One, ugh, yikes. Do I believe Ramona said, this is why we don't need Black people on the show? In my personal opinion, yes, I believe she said it. <clears throat> I do. I, I think she said it. I do believe she said it. Now, when it comes to Luann, maybe I'm naive, but I personally did not think that Luann was calling Ebony an angry Black woman. That's not the way I took it. However, I understand how Ebony experienced it, particularly in that situation. And so I do think that there is something to be said about having the conversation around when you say certain things to certain people, 
This is how that person experiences it, whether it's your intent or not, right? And that's the conversation that they had and in, in how they like dealt with all of that, right? So I get that there. I actually think Luann was intimidated by Ebony. And when Ebony said, I'm the most educated person here, I think because Luann, like they said, you know, went to high school and has a nursing degree, which is fine and admirable. There is literally nothing wrong with any of it. I think Luann was insecure about her own level of education because Ebony is intimidating. She's beautiful. She's educated. She's successful. That is also an intimidating situation. I think it does get sticky when you're in a room or in, in a, a situation with all white people and you're called angry as a woman. I do understand how Ebony felt, but I don't think that Luann was calling her an angry black woman in that trope, in that trope, right? But I do think that conversation is needed to be had understanding what's a microaggression, understanding what is offensive to certain groups and what isn't, right? The same way Luann was offended about her education. Somebody else wouldn't take offense to that. If somebody said uh, at the table, I'm the most educated person here, I'd be like, okay, cool, good for you, degrees. You know, let's call Wendy Osepo, you know, like, you know, okay, degrees. I wouldn't take offense to that because I don't have a lived experience of where that has hurt me or there's an insecurity or there's a trauma there. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, also I feel like, and I don't mean to compare black women because I also am tired of that. Let's compare black women across the board, right? I'm tired of that too, but I don't know how else to make the point without doing that, but I want it to be transparent. I also think I, it, it's a chemistry fit. You know, I think the way that they brought in Leah to be, you know, young and cool on Roni that chemistry fit was not a fit because she did not fit with the ladies. So that was a flop. Ebony, I also don't think was a chemistry fit for this particular group. And I hope she wasn't brought on as just like, oh, it's, you know, we're in the 2020 now, 2021, you know, everything going on in the world. We need to cast a black person. It needs to be a token, you know, just to get diversity sake on the show. Whereas I don't think that Ebony was a chemistry fit for this particular groups of ladies. Not because Ebony is black, but because of Ebony's personality, I don't think she was a chemistry fit. I think there could have been tons of black women who would have been a chemistry fit. Very similar to, um, well, conversely, to, to prove the point, think about Beverly Hills. I think Garcelle is a great fit for Beverly Hills, not because she's a black token, but because of her personality. You know, she's a fan fave. She's one of the queens. She has the diamonds, baby. You know, we are here for Garcelle. And she is also within a group of all white women in a very white space. And she's talked about what it has felt like to be the only black woman within a white space. You know, she she brought up about how Kyle was like, oh, you didn't pay your charity bill. And, you know, um, and also how she was saying how she felt she had to hold back. So she didn't get called, quote, the angry black woman, the aggressive black woman. She's talked about that in those spaces, right? And those been those have been great conversations. But I think the reason why Garcelle fits isn't because she's black, but because of who Garcelle is, her personality. So I think when people are casting for race, it doesn't work. They need to cast for chemistry. And that is what works, right? And I, and this is, and again, I'm not, I'm surprised how much I'm, I'm not defending production per se, but I'm surprised at how much I'm understanding production's perspective because I see that this article or, you know, Ebony and Leah and, you know, all of them are trying to say they had a, we want to cover our butt session with talking about diversity and all that stuff. I'm like, don't be damned if you do, damned if you don't type situation. Because if we're really going to clean up the racism in this country, if we're really going to clean up what's going on, 
we have to start somewhere. We have to start with these conversations. We have to start with open dialogue. We have to start with a white woman saying, well, what if the black person doesn't have a father? What does that mean? And instead of saying, oh, she's so racist, say, hey, let me actually educate you on why that is racist, on why that is wrong, on why that is a trope, on why that isn't true, on why that is hurtful, right? So to me, I'm not side eyeing production and NBC for having that type of conversation. I'm like, okay, great. They're opening up the dialogue. You know, it can't be damned if you do, damned if you don't. And if they didn't have that conversation that, you know, um, whatever they called it, diversity hour, whatever they were calling it with everyone, then it would have been like, there was no sensitivity training. There was no racial sensitivity training. They never even talked about it. You know, I am all for let's open up the dialogue and have the hard conversations where people can feel comfortable saying, well, this is a stereotype, I believe. This is something I heard about Black people or white people or gay people or Hispanic people, you know, where they can feel safe that they're not going to be canceled or judged for saying these things. Because a big reason why we still have so much hate in this country and world is because we're not having those hard conversations. Because people are saying these things in private where they got these ideas from because they're too afraid to say it in public. And it's only in the light that they can learn the truth about things and the truth about people and the truth about race and gender and all of that stuff. So again, I'm confused as to what point they're making with this. And Ramona is a 70 year old something white woman who of course has probably a lot of very racist beliefs that she holds. And the only way she's not going to hold them is through talking about it. Now, I'm not saying that her calling someone the N-word is okay. Absolutely not. I'm not defending that at all. These are, these are two very separate conversations. There is never an excuse for calling somebody an N-word ever. Point blank, period, full stop. But talking about certain stereotypes in racial profiling that you have held about a community and saying, well, listen, this is what I was taught. Let's talk about it. I think is progress, right? That's just sort of how I feel about it. But let me know what you guys think. And I'm not defending Ramona at all. All I am saying is that we need to start somewhere to have these conversations. All right. That season, Singer also allegedly told a Black woman staffer, there's so many of you guys here now. Please don't change your hair as I'm not going to be able to remember anybody's names. Singer says that was the kind of a thing she commonly did. It was a strictly commentary on my inability to remember names. As an example, just last week, I saw a photo with me and Travis Kelsey from 2016 on Watch What Happens Live, and I thought he was Jax Taylor. She emailed Vanity Fair, referring to a Vanderpump Rules cast member. According to two people familiar with production, Singer exclaimed, there's so many black chicks. Singer denies saying this, the footage that aired in the season shows her using the phrase black chicks, right? Again, when it comes to this, do I think she said it? Yeah, there's footage of it, right? I totally 100% think she said it. Now, for this particular comment, again, I think it could be better utilized of well, let's talk like let's talk about why that's a very effed up thing to say. Why that's a very hateful thing to say. Why that's a very hurtful thing to say. Why that's a very the why that's a thing that dehumanizes black women, right? Don't change your hair, I won't be able to re to recognize you. Oh my god, there's all these black chicks. Those are horrible things to say, right? But those could be moments for, well, let's tackle those things. Because if you're going to try and tackle diversity by add, by just checking a box, by adding a Black cast members, that's not going to do the job. It's having the tough conversations without um, villainizing the person, right? So for Ramona to say that, which is extremely hurtful, extremely dehumanizing to say to someone, don't change your hair, I won't be able to recognize you all. It's horrible to say. 
But if they actually addressed it in a meaningful way, then they would actually be making progress. Then it would be like, okay, I get it. Let's all have these conversations, right? I think that there's been a lot of missteps and missed opportunities here. And I'm not defending Ramona Singer. I want to say that to the cows come home. This is not a defense of her because I do think she said some extremely racial things. And I, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not defending her. I'm just discussing ways that it could have gone better for everyone involved. Darian Edmondson, Harrington before she married, Darian, okay, was a senior producer on season 13, her first Bravo production. No one ever said officially I was hired, but Ebony was the first black talent that was brought on for New York, Edmond Edmondson told Vanity Fair. I think that they were specifically looking for a black female producer. A source involved with production says new producers are typically introduced to the cast, but that didn't mean that, but that didn't happen with the new black hires on Roni. If the cast is not being told from the executives, these people are here to do this X job, that person said. The cast is going to make up their minds who they talk to and who they don't talk to. Edmondson says she wasn't able to produce Morgan, De La Seps, or Singer. They simply didn't respond to her text or calls. So it, was a su so it seemed unusual when Singer spoke to her after a scene filmed on November 6th of 2020 in Singer's home. Here is how the hot sheet described the conversation. Ramona says she doesn't want to talk about race, religion, or creed. Ramona tries to change the subject again, asking about who Ebony is dating. She asks Ebony if the guy is black, white, or what. Ebony says she thought Ramona didn't want to talk about color. Ramona says, now I have to watch what I'm saying to you. I feel like whatever I say is wrong. A person who sees the hot sheets said that while they don't recall that one specifically, they would not dispute it. Cannot confirm nor deny. <clears throat> After this scene, Williams left. Edmund remained. Um, Edmondson remained, she says, at Ward and Paparazzo's instruction. A source familiar with production denies Paparazzo asked her to stay. Singer told Edmondson that her interaction with Williams reminded her of when Jewish colleagues used a Catholic slur with her when she was a young woman and called her a shiska, a Yiddish term for a non-Jewish woman. Edmondson hadn't heard the word before and later had to ask her mother what it was. According to Edmondson, she said, Ramona, I have no idea what you're talking about. To which Singer said, oh, it's literally like somebody calling you a N-word. Singer says she never said the N-word and that this account is a misrepresentation. I did describe an incident where I was called a shiska while working in college, she wrote, but I did not compare it, but I did not compare the two experiences. Edmondson wrapped up the conversation without addressing what Singer had just said and says Singer thanked her, but she discussed the moment with a shot colleague and said her husband and friend text about what happened, which Vanity Fair has reviewed. Then Edmondson started crying. I should have said something, she says. She told herself, Ebony's fighting this fight this season. Okay, side note. I believe the producer. A, why would the producer make this up? What would to what goal would the producer make up that Ramona Singer said this so she could get fired and blacklisted and never work again because she's exposing what happened? I believe I believe the producer 100 percent. I also believe the producer when she said that Luann and Sonia and Ramona did not respect her and did not return her calls and did not take direction from her. I believe that 100 percent. Do I think it was because she was black? Probably on a subconscious level, yes. Do I think it's because they thought that she wasn't an important enough producer? Yes. As we know, certain housewives have their favorite producers and producers have their favorites. And the fact that this woman was Black, the fact that she seemingly seems to be younger, and also that she was new, do I think they disrespected her? 100%. Do I believe what she said Ramona said? 100%. 100%. I do. I do. I think she's telling the truth. She says she talked to Ward and Paparazzo about it that night. They said, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. According to multiple people who worked on season 13, other production members went to Warner Brothers Discovery HR about Singer's comments throughout the season. Edmondson endeavored to make herself feel better. At least she's getting comfortable around me, was how she rationalized Singer 
easy use of the N-word. I always felt like Darian and I had a great relationship, Singer told Vanity Fair. Well, yeah, because she probably didn't know how to stand up to you. You know, I have personally been in situations where racially, where the N-word has been used or something racist has been said. And as the Black person in the room, you feel shock, you feel stifled, you freeze. You don't really know how to respond. You don't really know how to push back. You don't really know how to speak up for yourself or how to deal with the situation. Because we've been so conditioned that if we do say something, then, oh, now you're drama. Oh, angry Black woman. Oh, you're aggressive. Oh, you're being sensitive. You're just paranoid. You know, oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, so I have personally been in situations where someone that I loved very dearly and considered a very dear friend said the N-word very casually. And I was the only Black person in the room and I did not know how to respond. So I understand what this person is saying. So for Ramona to be so disconnected to reality, thinking she has a great relationship to this person, I'm sure in Ramona's delusional mind, she did think she had a great relationship with her because one, she dismissed her and didn't, and didn't respect her. And two, Edmondson didn't say anything to her, which is ridiculous. Now, now we're getting into the territory where I'm like, bravo, NBC production, y'all dirty. Y'all dirty. This is the territory where we're getting into. All the other stuff about, oh, drinking and Leah and blah, 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 blah. Like, miss me with all the other performative stuff. For me, it's what are the tangible moments where someone was clearly attacked or, you know, racially discriminated against or something racial happened, where someone was clearly, you know, assaulted in a sexual way without their consent, where someone was clearly exploited, right? And also talk about money, how much money NBC, how much money Bravo and these production com companies make and how little the quote talent makes, right? No residuals and all that. For me, yes, get the union and the mental health. That is more of where I'm like, okay, they need to do better. But this other performative stuff, I'm like, miss me with it. Miss me. Okay. Da -da -da -da. But on a different day of filming with Williams, Edmondson recalls, literally we broke down hysterically and cried in each other's arms. And I'd never seen in my life in a decade of working in TV either shown emotion like that with a cast member. Williams had tried to quit the show November 6th, the same day Singer allegedly used the N-word, but Williams didn't know about the incident at the time. On November 9th, Williams said that Ward, Paparazzo, and Shannon employed her to stay over a video call. Williams says they told her, listen, what you're giving us is exactly what we want. If we wanted a different Black woman, we know how to get them. Shannon suggested Williams bear the racial um, animus she was experiencing more lightly, as Williams recalls it, reminding her, Ebony, this show is a comedy. Producers deny that Williams tried to quit and that they asked her to stay, though someone with knowledge says a producer told Ebony and others generally that Real Housewives is partly comedic in nature. Viewers tend, tend to see the show as an escape. Emails reviewed by Vanity, by Vanity Fair show Paparazzo, Ward, and Shannon had a Zoom call with, Ward, with Williams on November 9th. At the last dinner of the season at Singer's Hampton's home, a party planner hired by production set the table with raw cotton. According to some, it was supposed to look like snow. Once again, Williams had to provide context. Shed acknowledges the situation that they addressed it immediately. But it wasn't until after the season began airing in 2021, almost a year later, that Williams heard Singer had been reported to Warner Brothers HR and that it had been determined that Singer said that singer said she had difficulty telling black crew members apart. Yikes. At that point, Williams requested a series of meetings with NBC Universal. During one meeting with NBCU executives and an outside lawyer, Williams says she was told an investigation into whether singer had said the show didn't need black people was quote, inconclusive. Okay, I'm gonna stop there for a second. We'll get back to it. This is a thing when it comes to Ebony. I personally did feel a little exhausted about Ebony teaching us about Black history, Black pride, every single episode. And what I mean by that is every single thing was like, 
Martin Luther King and Harriet Tugman, and we're going to go to Harlem and everybody's going to have a Black History Month, you know, tidbit. That did get to be taxing on me because as a Black woman, I live, <laughs> I live this, I know this. You know, I just wanted to see Ebony being Ebony. I wanted to revel in her Black excellence as a woman of just her existing. I wanted to see her having fun, kikiing, you know, dating and shopping and, you know, being the boss, babe. I didn't need every single episode to be a Black History Month episode. I, ag I agree with it that way. I don't agree with it in saying you need to take things racially set against you more lightly. To me, these are two different things, you know, like, like, again, I, I'm, I hate comparing black woman to black woman, but we have to do it in this context. I hate doing it. But like with Garcelle, you know, Garcelle just shows up and she is black excellence. She's just amazing. She's a moment. She's a beat. I love her. She's not doing black history month lessons every episode of um, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills but she is a moment and we love her. And when she needs to address something that is racially charged, she addresses it in the moment and up front and it gets dealt with. I think that was more of Ebony's misstep. I don't know if production told her that she needed to sort of be like the voice of the black people on the show and all of this stuff, but she made it too heavy. But that's not to say that I think she should not have been vocal about situations that made her feel discriminated against or racial microaggressions or things like that. I'm not saying she had to pretend that was not happening to her when it was. That's not what I'm saying. So to me, these are two separate conversations. One is, Ebony, you needed to show up and just be you and have fun and and do keep it light, but in general, not you can't be honest about somebody saying you're angry and how that makes you feel as a black woman in this country. Those are two separate conversations going on, right? So there is that. Okay. William says someone on the call confirmed the company determined Singer had said the N-word, but William says the lawyer, who was not representing NBCU, tried to downplay the issue. To paraphrase, Singer didn't call Edmonton the N-word. She just said the N-word. William says that NBCU's chief diversity, diversity officer, who is biracial, was present. He told the lawyer, no, what we're not going to do is sit here and litigate the capacity in which the N-word was used in the presence of a Black woman. NBCU did not comment. William says, that was the only time I felt like anybody on the other side of this had any competency. Bingo, 100% agree 100%. Because this is the thing. Anytime someone who is not Black says the N-word, it is wrong. In any context. Any context. That is my personal opinion. So for them, try to split metaphorical hairs that do not exist. She didn't call her one. She just said it. Just saying it is the problem. So I agree with this 100%. To do a comparison, right? Same exact thing with Erica Jane. Last season on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills at the reunion, when she was allegedly, because I think she was lying on Kathy in my pers personal opinion. Remember she got up there and she was like, Kathy said, oh, he's an old F word, you know, uh, the homophobic slur. And the word just came off her tongue like it was like it was like gravy. And she said the whole wor wor word, you know, the F word for um, it's a homophobic slur. That was also extremely problematic. You know, nobody gets to say that word. Just saying it is wrong. Right. And I'm not comparing being, you know, our, um, you know, LBGQTIA community to the black community. I'm not saying that our situations are the same but we have similar hurdles, right? You know what I mean? And so it's like, I never would say the F word. I would never say that because saying it is wrong, you know? And that's the problem. And the fact that she said it is the problem. So I agree with them on that. It's the mere fact that you said the word is problematic. All right. 
What I recognized, even in the midst of my own trauma, is I still had the most power of any Black person involved in this thing, William says. They are just young Black women trying to go to effing work. Edmondson had not been hired for a Bravo series since her one and only Roni season, which ended filming in 2021. For the first time in Housewives history, no oh wait. Sorry, guys, I lost my spot. It went crazy. Doo -doo -doo -doo. One second. Oh, why did it do that? Okay, for the first time, oh my gosh. Okay, for the first time, sorry about that. For the first time in Housewives history, the, reun the reunion, which typically films about a month before the finale airs, was canceled. At the time, Bravo attributed this to scheduling challenges. Now, a source with knowledge says the reunion was put on hold during an, in an investigation into Singer's conduct and ultimately never happened. Roni went off the air for almost two years. When it came back, it had a new cast and a legacy Ultimate Girl strip starring Singer, De La Seps, and Morgan, helmed by Paparazzo, which filmed in St. Bart's in June of 2023. Shed produced both, as well as the Ultimate Girl strip season that Singer filmed three months after Roni, season 13, wrapped. Someone familiar with production says, as soon as Shed became aware of concerns related to contact on Roni season 13 production, producers immediately reached out to the affected employees to make sure they were supported, and Shed hired an outside investigator to conduct a thorough and confidential investigation where issues were substantiated, appropriate corrective actions was taken. These measures were taken over two years before the casting of Ultimate Girls Trip St. Bart's Legacy. This, okay, this is where production is a is full of crap full of crap you knew what ramona said you knew what she did and you still casted her production you're dead wrong just say yes we knew she used the n-word and we didn't care D call a thing a thing because that's what it was don't talk about some impartial investigation that's a bunch of bull you knew what she said and you didn't care okay Sources differ on when the allegations of Singer's use of the N-word were communicated between the companies, which illustrates how complicated the processes and reporting chains can be on these shows. Why do they stay? It is a promotional machine unlike anything you can even buy, says Williams, who tried to develop her own show with Bravo after season 13. Money and clout, says McSweeney. See, now we're being honest. Now we're being honest. Money in clout. There you go. One housewife wonders who should be uh, um who who she would be otherwise. Is it any wonder why we cling to a well to cling to it well past its expiration date? Frankel is one of the few examples of a Bravo star whose success transcends the network, and even she hasn't cleaved herself completely. Frankel quit the show, sold the cocktail division of her company, Skinny Girl, for a report at one hundred million dollars while filming a Bravo spinoff returned, then quit again, then developed several more shows with Bravo. In 2022, she started a podcast about the Real Housewives called Rewives, distributed by iHeart Podcast. Frankel says that former Roni castmate and former best friend Jill Zarin's July 2023 appearance on her podcast is what prompted her to reevaluate her relationship with Bravo and reality TV generally. The truth about what came on came, came up on the podcast is, like everything in this story, complicated, and has been the subject of housewives infighting and proxy wars on page six on Watch What Happens Live and among fans. Disclosure, I am one. On Just Be, Frankel's other podcast, Zaron revealed that she didn't know Frankel would be filmed attending the January 2018 funeral of Zaron's husband, Bobby. She, would have, she wouldn't have looked like had she shown up, she said, hand to God should have Bobby turn in his grave, Frankel says she believed Zarin was aware. A source with production knowledge tells Vanity Fair that a spokesperson for Zarin indeed had reached out and invited filming at the funeral. Zarin supposedly also invited a crew to Shiva, but they declined. Zarin told Vanity Fair that her former publicist suggested asking if Shed wanted to film the funer funeral, Bobby had loved being a house husband, or Zarin was a cast member from 20 
two, from 2008 to 20 to 2011, Zara, Zarin agreed. It's an honor for Bobby to be honored on a national television and be respected, she says. The emails went back and forth, including with a suggestion for a made-for-TV Shiva, but Zarin said her ultimate understanding was that there would not be camera present outside the service. Zarin says she's not upset that, produc that production came afterward. What she calls an effing ambush was that she wasn't prepared or paid for what became a huge, heavily promoted Bravo moment, her long-awaited televis televised reconciliation with Frankel, her estranged best friend. Zarin says she wouldn't have asked to be compensated if they had documented Bobby's memorial because she considered that a tribute to him. Otherwise, she said she would have said, write me a check for 100K and put it into the memorial fund. She, she, she also wasn't happy when Cohen later indicated Zarin was lying about knowing it would be filmed. Yet, even after all of this, Zarin still wanted to be on Bravo. Again, this goes back to what I was saying. You know, they get exploited and manipulated and duped, but yet they're addicted. I think that these people are addicted to the money. They're addicted to the, quote, fame. They're addicted to the cameras. They're, they're addicted to it, you know? In 2021, she started Ultimate Girls Trip Season 2, which was produced by Shed, the production company Zarin says crashed Bobby's funeral. I want to vomit at how I kissed Andy's butt to come back, Zarin says now. She says she was in talks to join Legacy Cast, but the negotiation ended because Bravo was offering less money than Zarin felt she deserved. Zarin, Zarin, whatever. On July 21st, Frankel posted a now infamous TikTok in which she grapples with assailing a grieving widow for TV and calls for a reality reckoning. It got a lot of pickup, Frankel says now. It seemed fairly obvious to me. Then I said, how am I going to further, how am I going to go further with this? I can't just talk and not do something. In addition to her stated goal of securing future rights for cast and crew with input from SAG-AFTRA, Frankel says she's planning to meet with network and streaming executives about improving conditions. Oops, one second. About improving in conditions on reality productions. The housewife conjury sounds a bit like problem gambling, and the housewife always in the house always wins, which Bravo rem reminds cast members. People are going to like you because we edited you well, so don't worry, McSweeney says Cohen told her before her first season premiered. We literally are walking into a casino thinking we're going to change families' lives, make a fortune, and ride off into the sunset, one housewife says. But if you were, say, the most successful housewife ever, you would not be able to chart it without charting also absolute emotional destruction, public humiliation, divorce, death, crime, prison, shame, misogyny, and just an onslaught of pure hate. This is the thing. Bethany, the reason why I think Bethany has gotten on board with this is because Bethany is bored and she misses um, being in the limelight. That's really what I think because she has the money. She has oodles and oodles and oodles of money. So it's not about money. And I, I also don't think it's really about righting these wrongs. I think Bethany needed a project, and I think Bethany wanted to stay relevant. Her shows were not landing. Um, that's why I think she had the podcast about the housewives, because she knew that was a draw. <coughs> Sorry, one second. I've been talking for like two hours. <laughs> because she knew that was like a draw. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I think this is kind of for attention. I think this is sort of attention seeking behavior on my part, on her part. I really do. But you know what? Someone's got to do it. So, hey, Bravo and its partners who make these shows are employers at the end of the day. Based on documents shared with Vanity Fair, a contract might state that cast members will be paid only for the episodes in which they appear, which may be fewer than the number they film. However, their obligations, including promotion and filming, continue for the duration of the contract. Outside unscripted work and press opportunities may be subject to approval requirements. See, now we're getting into the nitty gritty. This is the stuff I think needs to be addressed. How much Bravo is 
pimping them and exploiting them. If you have to work, you should be paid for that work, in my opinion, whether they aired or not, because you worked. You know what I mean? If I go to a factory job and I'm, you know, canning things together, whether or not the warehouse sells the cans, I should be paid for canning the cans. So I agree there needs to be some type of conversation about, you know, um, being compensated for the work you do, making more safer work environments, not being exploited and all of that stuff. That I agree with. There are non-disclosure agreements as well as non-disparagement agreements, which Frankel has rail railed against. Confidentiality clauses are standard practice in reality programming to prevent disclosure of storylines prior to air, the network wrote in a statement to Variety. Any current or former cast or crew is free to discuss and disclose any allegedly unlawful acts in the workplace, such as harassment or discrimination or any other conduct that they have reason to believe is inappropriate. Okay, um, they're lying with that one. I don't think they have non-disclosures um, agreements because they're worried about storyline leaking. We know all the storylines months in advance because we have a thing called TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, page six, radar online, reality blurb, and the housewives themselves. We already know all of the storylines. <clears throat> That's why we were talking about Mauricio and Kyle splitting up for months and Beverly Hills just aired. That's not true. You only have an NDA because you're trying to hide something. You see what I'm saying? They're not worried about storylines. Okay. And then there's a waiver of privacy clause. Two Warner Brother contracts with Bravo talent viewed by Vanity Fair state. The appearance, actions, sounds, and statements of artists and others and the information related or revealed thereby may be of, pers of personal, private, surprising, defamatory, disparaging, embarrassing, offensive, or an otherwise unfavorable or injurious nature and may be factual or fictional and may expose artists to public ridicule, humiliation, or condemnation and may portray artists in a false light. <clears throat> so basically that means they have the right to lie on you. <laughs> they have the right to lie on you. That's what that says. We can lie on you and you can't do anything about it. That's what that says. When Frankel first read her contract, she decided, I can navigate this. I'm just a different breed. She also says, I was a prostitute at the highest rate possible and was aware that there was a transaction that was happening and that I, and that I was going to benefit from it. Hey, at least she's being honest with that one. Bravo has made adjustments based on information that leaked from troubled productions. The next um, Ultimate Girls Trip to Air will be Shannon and Pop Rosso's Legacy Edition. It switched slots with what was supposed to be the fourth season, which filmed in Morocco months before Legacy. In January of 2023, People published a story about cast member Brandy Glanville allegedly kissing co-star Kaylin Manzo multiple times throughout the evening without her consent during filming. The following month, Paige Sinks reported that on the same night, Glanville allegedly pinned Carolyn against the wall and put her hands on Carolyn's breast area and lady part area. During a March interview, Manzo, who was not publicly made, who has not publicly made any accusations, said, I can't say much, only because it's not good for my headspace. I would imagine it would unfold on the series when it airs, and there'll be a lot to be said about it then. Through her attorney, Derek Smith, she declined to comment to Vanity Fair. The same month, Glanville's attorney sent Warner Brothers a letter that read, the entire incident was comprised of some flirtatious conduct and kissing between Ms. Mando and Ms. Glanville, and all of it was absolutely mutual and consensual and called for it, <clears throat> and called for it to release all footage. Glanville says she and Mando were never alone and no one from production stepped in at any point. Glanville had behaved similarly on previous season of Ultimate Girls Trip. Glanville says NBCU executives sent positive feedback to the cast. Cast member Phaedra Parks told Vanity Fair she was sober that evening and observed Glanville and Mandel's interaction as nothing short of a modern day Holoquin romance. Love was winning. You're not in your right mind and you want to give them good TV, says Glanville. The whole point of these shows is to get us unhinged. If there was an issue or situation where someone was uncomfortable in Morocco, no one in production or the crew or cast, crew or cast intervened in the moment. I'm going to stop on this one. Listen, Brandy, stop lying. <clears throat> I believe Caroline Manzo on this. I do think that Brandy was inappropriate. I think she was blacked out. 
I think she was kissing and touching her without her consent. And it also came out that, what's her name? Oh, I forget where her name is. The redhead from Roni from a long time ago. She was there and she intervened and she uh, tried to unlock the door and step between them. And also the next day, production asked Brandy Glanville to leave. You know, Carolyn, um, Caroline left on her own accord. But I think there is something to be said about this. The production company that did Ultimate Girls Trip Morocco, which is what which is the season of Brandy and Caroline Manzo, is a different production company that did Ultimate Girls Trip Legacy with Sonia and all of them. That is and is also a different and is the same production company that did um, the other Ultimate Girls Trip that Brandy was on. So basically, one production company, the Shed Media one with Shannon and Paparazzo one, basically was the one that said, we'll take Ramona back, even though she said the N-word. We're going to praise Brandy for getting drunk and being sexually, you know, all over the place. It was a different production company that said, Brandy, what you did was wrong and you, you need to go home. So that right there shows you the difference between a production company that is taking care of talent and a production company that is not. Because the production company that Brandy, that Brandy got in trouble with is a different production company that did the other um, Ultimate Girls trips. Glanville says she heard nothing until she started posting a, about Bravo and Ultimate Girls trip on social media while she was hospitalized for information in October, at which point she got a text from Barry Goldstein, whom she had never heard of. Remember, Barry Goldstein is supposed to be the, um, the mental health person, telling her he was a psychologist who wanted her to call, to call her for a check-in. Bravo recently announced the season will premiere in 2024, though a source with knowledge of executive decisions says the network is still discussing whether it will still air at all. So if Bravo is willing to throw away an entire season, something went down. Caroline has refused to speak publicly. Something went down. Brandy was fired and told to leave. Something went down. You're not telling me that Bravo and NBC is going to lose all of the money they spent on an entire season if nothing went down. When they are willing to work with people who are criminals, alcoholics, racist, all like none of that stopped a season. Assaults, none of that stopped a season, but this did. What's really good? What's really good? On October 20th, Manzo's lawyer filed suit on behalf of Marco, Ve Marco Vega against NBCU, Bravo, Peacock, Warner Brothers, Shed, and Forest Productions, a subsidiary of Shed. Vega, who was an on-screen butler on Ultimate Girls to Park, alleges Granville sexually harassed him and that Parks smacked his butt. His bottom. <clears throat> Defendants allowed, condoned, and even encouraged Miss Glanville's sexually aggressive and offensive conduct, conduct on others on the set, the suit says. Warner Brothers does not comment on pending litigation. Okay. The article then goes on to talk about other stuff, but it is so long and I've been talking for two hours. We are going to stop it there. I'm going to drop the link in case anybody wants to come up and help me give my little voice a break. And then I'm also going to go over um, some of your candy cane questions and comments. But that is the bulk of the Vanity Fair situation with Bravo, with NBC, with all of that stuff going on. I may do a part two to get the second half or the, uh, the remaining part of it, but that was the bulk of it. So let's see what you guys are saying in the chat box. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Hi, Raina. She says, hey, Candy. Hey, sweetheart. Hey, Julius. What is up? Tay Tay the Savior says, did this take, this, did this take place in um, Ultimate Trips or Roni? All of that stuff. Arliss Fleet says, wow, this is bad. Deb says, I was just thinking Bravo was hanging on by a thread. Too many lawsuits. 
Shout out to Deb. Thank you so much for holding me down. Barb says, great to see you back on here. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Hey, Deb. Hey, Welslyn. Hello, everybody. Hey, Queens. It's hi, Candy Canes. Queen says, Leah should have never gone on the show having addiction if she wasn't strong in her sobriety. And yes, they should do some type of psych test. Mm. I agree. I agree with that. All right. I got my second wind. Let's just go ahead and finish. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> other reality shows that other networks have made have had to make corrections. The Bachelor reportedly instituted a two drink an hour restriction after two intoxicated Bachelor in Paradise cast members reportedly had an on camera sexual encounter. On the British dating show Love Island, past cast members have said they're allowed two units of alcohol a day, and vigorous mental health protocols were put in place following the taking of one's own no longer being on this earth of two former cast members and the show's longtime host. On Netflix's Love is Blind, a dating series with single with single session casts, a cast member accused producers of not su supporting her with mental health care, although emails viewed by Vanity Fair shows she was offered post-show therapy. This month, a cast member filed a lawsuit asserting she was sexually assaulted while under a 24-hour surveillance and no producers intervened. Chris Colin, the creator of Love is Blind and CEO of Kinetic Content told people that casts are not filmed or managed around the clock and that we can't be accountable if someone doesn't tell us that they have a concern. On Kinetic shows like Love is Blind, The Ultimatum, and Married at First Sight, professionals interview each cast member prior to filming to evaluate whether they're in a headspace to be on and subsequently off reality television. All right, Rena, you want to share? Oh, hi. Hi. Hi, I just want to say you did a really, really, really good job. Oh, thank you. It was really thank good, so very much. thorough. And the other thing I wanted to say is that I don't think this lawsuit's going to go anywhere. Um, because how could you hold a production company responsible for you getting too drunk? Agreed. I mean, there's other housewives, like you said, that don't drink. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see how you can blame someone for you getting too wasted. Yes, I think they encourage the drinking. They don't allow them time to eat and stuff like that. But there are a lot of housewives who didn't drink and I, they weren't forced to. So, mm -hmm. I agree 100% with that. It's like you have to take accountability. And also, how much is it you're being pressured or how much is it you think you have to perform a certain way? Because those are two different things, right? One person pressuring you versus self-imposed pressure. Yeah, I also I also feel that they get um, overwhelmed and the whole situation is stressful on itself. Mm -hmm. So I get, you know, why they might overindulge. I, I understand. But I don't think that's a reason to sue someone. You know? Agreed. It's a reason to just don't join the show. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Hey, Natasha, you want to sound off? Hey, um, yeah, I was just like agreeing with Rena there. Um, it's a tough call because I understand the pressure. It's like an imbalance of power kind of thing, but mm -hmm. technically they're not being forced to drink. They're not, they, there's not like a technical gun to their head. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like hard to kind of like prove that other than like, just like the imbalance of power and the pressure to keep your job. But like, that's difficult, like I said, to prove. Mm -hmm. um, I basically agree with like, everything you said especially with like the, your character analysis <laughs> of um what's her face all the way in the left see i forgot her name leah. Because, leah she is insufferable she's definitely i like how you added weird because that's a very mm -hmm. big part of why i don't like her as well <laughs> like, mm -hmm. there's just something off and like almost creepy um and with bethany it's always been difficult like i always I always was like kind of in the middle with her just throughout her um, presence mm -hmm. on um, Roni. 
like there's the times where I'm like, okay, that was a good one, Bethy, like that. But then there's been times where she it was just like when she she has gone so far and just like broke people down verbally on more than one occasion that was pretty hard to watch. Like I'm thinking Sonia and um even Luann that time. And even with like Ramona, but Ramona of course gave it back to her. But, and it's just, that's why it was so obnoxious to even witness her repeat the words that were called on Rachel, you know, when she's like, just hearing that, I'm thinking about, I have a daughter. It's like, um, these it's people like, have daughters. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Luann, had, Luann has a daughter. I remember how she went off on her at um, the Berkshires. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. calling her every name under the sun. Yep. And didn't care and never apologized. And so for her, yeah, it's just the hypocrisy is a lot. I That's one of my, like, pet peeves in life. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the lack of self-awareness. It's like, do you not realize what you do? And mm -hmm. then maybe this is why this is making you mad because deep down inside you know you do it and maybe you don't like it, like, on a subconscious level. Like, mm -hmm. I don't even understand hypocrisy because, like, I like to think that I don't, really do it that often i'd hope but like i don't know it's just i don't understand because it's so obvious um i do think that this seems kind of opportunistic of lena um mm -hmm. she, exactly what you said when she went on that show she was just like a wet blanket complaining to everyone that would listen she yeah. had that like monotone voice going strong and was just like oh no and that's all you heard it's like why are you here like yep. you're getting paid a quarter of a million dollars. Yes. After, before taxes, but still for a week's vacation in Thailand and all you're doing is complaining and we're supposed to watch you and like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, what in what world sweetheart? And yeah, she's just very strange. I don't think she has an identity and it's just, she's very, seems very unhinged. Um, and very like, fake. And yeah. very fake. Like, I feel like she came on with an agenda that she was going to be like the woke, sex positive person, but that's not really even who she is. She's actually very conservative, Republican. You know what I mean? And it just seemed really fake. And like, her and Ebony so clearly were not friends. It's right. And just like her and Candace, I don't think are really friends. Um, no, that's just opportunist. That was because Candace didn't have anybody, neither did Leah. Exactly. And they just kind of like were the two leftovers and stuck together. Mm -hmm. um, that picture that you chose of Andy is like, <laughs> 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 what reunion was that again? I forget. Jersey. That Jersey? Yeah, that's what I Yeah. Thought. I forget what else. Like, what? You, there was something else that I wanted to say, and I forgot to write it down. Oh, come with it. I like I've been talking for like two hours. So like if you could talk and say my voice, I'd love it. <laughs> I know, right? Um, Ebony, like Ebony's a tough call. Like she has valid concerns, but there's like multiple things happening here. She also wasn't likable. Yeah. And Adam makes a good point. He says Kim Richards could be a candidate. Um, Bravo didn't seem to care about her alcoholism. That's true. I think Kim is kind of one of the more innocent people in the situations where she was really exploited and she didn't really do anything that bad. You know what I mean? She was exploited by her sister mostly. Cause it was like, yep. it was like, yeah. Like it's like cast on cast crime type stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That needs to be addressed too, because it's like, if all the cast members are like, you guys are so mean to us, but then look what they did, you know, like the plotting in the planet, like what happened with Beverly Hills and Potomac and all of that stuff. Like, they need to be held accountable for their actions too. I think it's just like the whole, it's just like multiple things happening all at the same time, multiple layers that have just gotten out of control over the years. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so that's why you can't really pin it on one thing anymore. It's just like multiple sectors, like between production, between the cast, between like everyone just kind of knowing the game a little too well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's just, it's gotten out of hand and I'm personally kind of sick of it because it's, it's not Me authentic. Too. It's I mean, like it never was a hundred percent authentic, but like at least it resembled some kind of authenticity, you know, like in the beginning. Yeah. Now it's just like, 
these women are like playing characters. They're hiding the relationship. It's like, why are you on the screen? Like this is like, this show is supposed to represent your life exactly. and you're hiding your love life. You're, you're presenting as something like you yeah. were presenting. You're like with Uba, like you were full, your whole character was being based around being single and to like, find exactly. out you weren't the entire time. Yep. I don't like being lied to. <laughs> yeah, That's I had, something about me. I have a, a very big issue with Uba and Jenna Lyons lying about being single and then getting exposed that they weren't. Because don't make it a storyline. That's That to me is the deception part. Don't do that, you know? That's the main part. It's like, it's one thing, like, I get it. It's still not cool. But the fact you made it a storyline that you were single... That's the part that comes across very deceptive. Exactly. And that's why she kept losing her mind about the phone and you didn't tell me cameras were here. And that's why she seemed so erratic was because she was keeping a secret. It's make, it makes so much sense now. Yeah, that's why she was being so paranoid. Hey, so I was like, this woman is out of her mind otherwise. Exactly. <laughs> but I also wanted to say, like, isn't the point of this to be reality? Like, it's reality TV. And these are very real situations. So how are the producers supposed to like blur the lines of things that are actually happening? That's real. That's a good question. I think there needs to be a clearer line of when is it appropriate for production to step in? Well, for example, like the situation mm -hmm. with Ramona and Ebony, I honestly feel like it was a really shameful season to watch, but it was very real. Yeah. It was it was very very real, and you can't if Ramona is a racist, you can't hide that. Yep. You know what I'm saying? You, you ha what is production supposed to do? Like put a disclaimer? Maybe they could put a disclaimer and say this episode could be triggering for people. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a very interesting season to watch. I agree. I agree. I think. Um, I think when it comes to production and whether or not they step in i think i think they should only step in if if someone's well-being is at stake y yes yes you know what like, i mean because yeah. like they do need to some, sometimes just let things play out like you said it was a hard to watch season but it was real so like we want those moments to like watch it but there's also times where it's like well wait a minute someone is vomiting wait a minute, somebody looks like they're blackout drunk. Like, for example, where I think production should have stepped in was Beverly Hills. No, 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 I'm, excuse me. Real Housewives of OC. When it was Tamar Judge and somebody else, and they wanted to get, I think it was Gretchen. And they said, we're going to get her blackout drunk, you know, um, and and they put her in the closet with, with Tamara's son, who was like touching her when she was blackout wasted naked wasted or something like that. To yeah. me, that's a situation where production should have said, we're stepping in because you have a woman who is blackout drunk and then you have a man who is touching her inappropriately in the closet or wherever, or wherever they were coming onto her in a sexual way. That is assault. Yeah, yeah. And, it, like and they literally filmed it on camera. And then you have two yeah. other people, which is disgusting, one being his mother, being like, yeah, let's get this girl naked wasted. Yeah, yeah. And people that really do problem. things like that in real life. They do. They do. They do. And, it's, and, and usually someone steps in. Yeah. I mean, not only say usually, but, you know, in a good scenario. Mm -hmm. It's really disturbing that that was his mom in the end, too. When you really yeah. think about that, it's the stuff we yeah. witnessed 10, 12 years ago that just brew. It, like, we knew it was messed up, but, like, now, like looking back, we're like, what? See, but that's the thing. That's that's the trick of it. And that's what makes it dangerous. I would say in the moment, you don't even realize it. it's messed up. Like, I didn't think it was messed up when I first watched it with like my little brain. But like now, <laughs> looking, you know what I mean? But now looking at it, I'm like, oh, like what in the world? I'm literally watching a woman be sexually assaulted. She's blackout drunk. Like this is there's insane. Touching her inappropriately, yeah. and there's an entire camera crew and party and he was, like, going on. Like that her. wrong. You know, but at the time, that never registered to me. I when I was watching that, I didn't think anything. I was like, oh la 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 la. Like, 
I'm like, oh, this is you know drama. I mean? la, la, la. But, yeah. But it's weird, think, but like, okay, realize, they must really not like her. But then but you realize that's choose? why now there is so much going on that we've been so desensitized to. Do you guys you know think I mean? they pick and choose with the drinking? Because didn't they take Dorinda off because she drank too much? Like they were saying that she needs to, you know, kind of get it together before she comes back. Meanwhile, um, Heather Gay is like getting borderline alcohol poisoning every time she goes to a trip. Like, did you see that one episode this season? Yeah. She's like dying in the van. I don't think they pick and choose when it comes to the drinking. I think it's whether or not that particular housewife is landing. I think it was mm. no longer enjoyable to watch Dorinda because she was angry and she was she just had some stuff going on. She wasn't on. a fun drunk. And she was no longer enjoyable to watch. And I personally think, and it just so happened that she was drinking a lot. But Sonia, you look at how much she has drank Sonia's and look at Maricel and look at all these other people who drink so much. I think it just depends on, is that housewife particularly likable and landing at that moment? And if they happen to drink a lot, okay. And if they don't, okay. But I don't think it has anything to do with their drink. Agree. Yeah, it's not out of concern. Yeah. Hey, CC, you want to sound off? What's up, Candy? Oh my Hi. goodness! Hi. It's Hi. So Hi. Good to Hi. See you. I'm just I'm happy to back. be here. Can't keep a good girl down. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, I just I feel like you did a great job with um you know elucidating on that article that I was not about to read. So thank you for just kind of <laughs> giving me that good read. You're um, welcome. Thank you. But um, yeah, like this is like kind of a monumental time. I do feel like Bravo will fall in some kind of way. I don't know if NBC mm -hmm. is going to remove it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do think that this is, this is giving me Megan wants a millionaire. millionaire. Do y'all know about that? Like about that whole thing that happened with 51 Minds when the dude yes. was like, you know about that. I think it's going to give that because the fact that they're going to scrap Ultimate Girls Trip 4 reminds me of how they scrapped I Love yep. Money 3 because the dude won. And something happened. Yep. Ooh, ooh. It and was I feel crazy like it's deserved. Happened. It was absolutely nuts. But I feel like it's deserved. You know what I mean? I, I'm just mm -hmm. thinking of these big corporations taking advantage of talent, taking advantage of writers and actors and performers in general. And yep. they're not the talented ones, but they want to be talented. So they want to take away from the talented people yep. and not give them the money that they deserve and all that stuff. I, I, I think this is so deserved and I can't wait to but, see them crumble. I know that's but bad. But they are but... making money. The talent is making money. I mean, all the women on the screen here have made thousands and thousands, almost millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So they're making money. The fractions, what these people are making, like the heads are making. It's, it's, exactly. It's not, they could be well, making that's, more. That's in every... I just feel like that's just how the cookie crumbles, unfortunately. Wait, what happened with um the Me Megan Million? What was that? What happened that you just referenced? I forget. Oh, wait, wait, wait one second. I think when it comes to the money stuff, yes, they're making money, but it's not about whether they made money, got a check. It's about residuals. It's mm -hmm. about these mm -hmm. executives and these big corporations continuously making money off of the talent and then the talent no longer making those money like for example with like wga and with sag aftra the reason why they're out there you know striking and they're going against everything is they're like wait a minute you know sure i got this check this one time for this work but now you're going on to make millions and billions mm -hmm. and trillions of dollars off of my work and i'm not seeing any of that anymore yeah. that's not fair so mm -hmm. they're saying like even shows on netflix you're watching netflix you think oh this star must be making money those writers must be making money no they're not making any money by us watching their shows because they already got that one time fee whereas with like regular like network television you get something called residuals so like every time your episode airs you would get some you would get money for that you know and they were saying we need to have higher residuals better health care more protections around our 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 you know likeness like ai so they're not, so yes they get a check at some point but it's such a much bigger conversation about exploitation when it comes to money. I I'm personally am in SAG. I stand with my with my um, union, and we're out there fighting for that. So it's not that we're saying these people haven't made money. Yeah. It's it's the disparity of it. Like why yeah, should an executive understand. become a millionaire or a billionaire off of my work, where Thank now you. my little check is gone? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I was coming from more of like the writers have more of a a stake in that. I don't necessarily 
believe that the reality stars do because they don't put as much effort. They're not writing. I mean, they're putting their whole business out there. They're sa- kind of sacrificing their lives. I do think they should make more money. Uh, well, I, while they're not writing, but they are giving us their catchphrases. They're giving us you know, their events. And, and, yeah, that's and, what Nina yeah. point out. That, Did absolutely. I say Nina? Nini. <laughs> Oh, Nini. I mean, yeah. I was like, Nina. And you're like, yeah. I'm like, wait. wait. No, but she, she was saying how, like, all of a sudden she didn't even know. And, like, her face and likeness was, like, on, like, a bus in Australia. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah, like, being, and, and her memes and, like, everything. Her face has been used so much. And she is, she's getting zero. And it's, like, I can see how you, like, can't control that. But, like, there has to be something where they could, like, in my Register. opinion, they are the writers of the of exactly. those shows. They are the writers mm-hmm. because those are their words that they're saying. How do they not get executive Good privilege or, or you know anything like that? Like that's crazy. Like those are the words that they came up with out of off they dome. They need money for that and extra money for that. Yeah, no one wrote that. <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> Nobody I just wrote think, it, right? I just think it should be this: if any piece of content, whether it is scripted and there's actors and there's writers, whether it's reality, whether it's the reality people. Anytime a piece of content makes money, it is my personal belief that that money should be divided in a very fair and equitable way between all the people who made that piece of content possible. Mm -hmm. So yes, the executives, yes, the producers, but also the talent and also the writers and also the personalities, because it's not fair Mm -hmm. that the people who made this particular piece of content possible, some people are making money and other people aren't. Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's fair how some people make yeah. so much more money than others. Yeah. Yes, honey. Do you want to tell her about the <laughs> Megan wants a millionaire oh, thing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so basically... Just give me happened, the cliff notes. I might remember. I just forget. I'll give you the... It's, it's pretty gory. It's actually appropriate for spooky season. Mm. <laughs> but there was this guy, I forget, I forget what his name was, but he was on, you know, Megan Wants to Marry a Millionaire, some show on like VH1 or something like that. And he came on acting like he was like this big, bad millionaire guy, had this huge personality. I don't think he won that particular round, but they really liked him and they brought him back on the show. But it turned out that he was, like a lot of these people, a fraudster, really wasn't making all this money, doing some type of Ponzi scheme, whatever the hell it was. He ended up um, dating somebody in that world, and then he ended up dating somebody else. Long story short, he ended up, and this is a trigger warning for anybody for graphic things, he ended up chopping up the girl he was seeing and putting her dismembered body into a suitcase. And when they found her, uh, there was then a manhunt for him, and he ended up being found in a hotel room, and he had no longer Underlined. decided to be with us. He undelived himself. And so that's why they um, stopped the rail. And he was like the winner of like the spinoff show he was on. Oh. And there's been, unfortunately, there's been, I would do a lie, uh, deep dive on it, but I personally don't want that energy. But right. there has been so I many examples of people in reality stars who have gone on to unalive themselves or to unalive other people or to do types of, you know, heinous acts against other people. Um, think about the Duggars and all of their allegations yep. with the child. There, there was a proper serial killer on some dating show, like in the sixties or seventies, like one of yeah. the, one of the yeah. serial killers was like, yeah, actually yeah. It's called, it was called like the, uh, the, not the happy the dating time, show, the I've dating show that. serial killer, him, but like even to not that extreme, like so many things going on. Even now, I think it's like either like Janelle from like MTV's Teen Mom. I never watched that crap, but like her husband now <laughs> has been charged with you know abuse of their child. There's just so wow. much of it, and wow. like a part of it's like okay, well, it's reality TV, so we're getting real people, and unfortunately with the human experience, there are really dark people, but mm-hmm. it just seems to be astronomical <laughs> when it comes to reality television <laughs> and everything that happens. But yeah, so it's like that needs to be explored. And there was also things where, um, How there was something going it? on where like he was either texting producers or somebody was, but there were red flags about the way that he was abusing the girl he was with and producers knew about it and they did nothing. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. 
But oh, I, yeah. I, I, I oh, is yeah. there is there like a line? Like, like how there, do you prevent that? Yeah. yeah. Like, what are the produce? Like, that's the part that I do think that they need representation for and stricter contract guidelines for because if they're going to be shit faced, wasted, doing all this crazy shit, like when does production have the right to step in? When and do you need like severe psychological testing? I think I personally you- think production has the right to step in whenever they deem appropriate, because at the end of the day, or when should they? That, Maybe not necessarily the right is not the right word, but when should they intervene? Like I think they maybe should. medically. I think they should. I think they should <laughs> intervene when any rational person would say this is a dangerous situation. Yeah, but you know, a lot of times they don't. And that's why we're and that's why they're having this problem. That's why that's why we're having this problem. It's like that's why that's why we have a problem. It's like the pursuit for content. Sometimes common sense just like goes out the window. It's like they like black out or something. And I'm talking about the producers. It's like, and then they look back and they're like, oh yeah, I should have stepped in. But it's just like this hunger for like to get the story takes over. And it takes precedent over like safety and everything. So for example, Mm -hmm. when you see them getting like super shit face wasted, should produce production say, okay, we're cutting off the drinks. Yeah, here's some yes. water, sweetheart. Yeah, <laughs> they I, I would never do that, that though. I know. They should, but I'll put it this way: the reason why they should is because I'm not sure if this is—I don't, I don't know if this is a federal law. I think it's a federal law. But like, if you're at a bar, I was just gonna say that yeah. overserved. Hold on, Natasha. Natasha, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so like, if you, <laughs> it's Sorry, I got <laughs> okay. So like, if you are at a bar and you are clearly intoxicated. That bartender, that establishment is legally bound to cut you off. And if you they continue servi- servicing you with alcohol, you get in your car and you go kill someone, that bar is now legally responsible for what you did. So I'm confused as to why. And because we have to remember, this is a workplace. This is an employment situation. This is a corporation, an establishment. This isn't yeah. just people hanging out. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Why are they not held to that same level of standard and accountability? It's different if it was just like I'm at a barbecue and I get really wasted with my <laughs> friends and I go out there. I'm not that you know the friends aren't going to be held accountable for that, but I'm not at work. It's a totally different dynamic. So I do think there needs to be some type of level of accountability when yeah. you are in certain type of situations like that. Do you see what I'm saying? And yeah. even I think um When it comes to these, wouldn't apply to these particular women, but a similar idea, even with underage drinking, if you knowingly serve underage people at your house alcohol and then they go out and do something as the adults who who serve them in your house, you are legally liable for what they do. Do you on that topic, do you think that that's why sometimes these like, for example, Teresa got caught with her situation and Mm -hmm. Erica got caught with their situation? Do you think like the government came into the Bravo and was like, you're you might be liable for um, employing this person when they were spending all this money on your show that we were watching to try to So you better start cooperating kind of deal? Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking Bravo has something to do with that as well. Um, I think the only time like the government or the feds come in is when they have their ongoing, when they have their investigations and then they subpoena Bravo for all of their um, footage and stuff like that. That's where I think it, lands. I think the only time Bravo has said anything about Erica's drinking or anything like that is when there's been backlash from the fans based on their behavior. And then they use alcohol as an excuse. For example, when Erica cussed out Garcelle's son, she used, oh, I was drinking and popping pills as an excuse for what she did to him to get out of being responsible herself for doing it. I don't think anybody came to Bravo saying about her drinking. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think with that situation, I do Mm -hmm. sympathize a little bit with Erica after watching the footage. Not not because, like, she cursed out a kid and she definitely shouldn't have, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have my kids around people like adults that you know are highly stressed drinking you don't know them like that you know erica had been crass you i wouldn't have had my and if i had my kids around them and she 
was rude to my kid, I would kind of be mad at my, I would be mad at her, of course, but I, I wouldn't like, you know what I mean? Like she wasn't super mean to the kid. And I think, look, remember, mm. I remember watching it back this thing. Uh, like, I think she time. was. She I, was think, I think she was pretty mean to the child. I think she was trying to, looking at it, like it was like, she was like looking at the kid and was kind of trying to protect him and be like, get the fuck out of here. I am. Well, that's protection. <laughs> no, I, the, no, the way that she was talking to him. No, I, the way that she was talking to him. You know, she was talking to him like, "Listen, I am obliterated. I am fucked up. Please get away from me. I don't want you to look at me like that." Maybe let's, in her warped mind, but like, yeah, she was like cursing let's say and effed shouting. Up, effed up. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I I didn't look at it like she was angry at him she was like looking at him like a mom like i'm so fucked up you're on tv wait let's let's teams. stop with the f-bombs let's stop with oh, the sorry, sorry. i'm sorry <laughs> sorry okay. but yeah I, I didn't look at it like she was really mean to him. like either way she was shouting and cursing at a kid and he definitely looked shocked and disturbed by it i don't know yeah i mean i yeah. I personally didn't see her as trying to be a mother figure to him <laughs> by any means. No, I uh, she looked at him and she told him, told him to get the F out of here. I, I do think what she said was bad because I think that there need, we'd have to remember that children should be protected and he is a child. Yeah, And it is never okay for anyone to speak to him the way Erica spoke to her him and no, Garcelle is allowed okay. and Garcelle is allowed to have her children at her birthday party. Erica Jane is not allowed to cuss her child out regardless of the circumstances. No, no, you're you're right. But what I'm trying to say is that I don't think it was as bad. I, I didn't You don't think it. her intention was really no, to do that. That's what you're saying. No. The outcome still is bad. It was That's still bad. Yeah. I think her it intention was, was definitely bad. She definitely comes <laughs> directly from HD double hockey sticks. She is a demon and she has yes. no talent. And she's Agreed. like many and we people see she in has the no entertainment empathy. industry who don't have empathy and they're sociopaths and they, they just want to rule the world. Like that's what she is. She's like a Disney villain with no talent and she's not iconic. So I just I can't agree with that at all. I do want to touch on the whole Bravo mm -hmm. um drinking thing because I think the overarching issue with Bravo is the drinking because if you watch what well, watch what happens live Andy has all these like silly like drinking games like they're drinking from like a, a shot ski and there's like these silly like games like this is the game show network where people have to drink if they don't answer a question or something I just think mm -hmm. the whole thing is totally inappropriate I just feel like mm -hmm. the whole network is a walking red flag and like I said before I just can't wait to see it crumble because it's gonna crumble I'm a ninny fan to the death of me and I just feel like she totally built that network up to be what it was. So for them to do Nene like how they did her, she better get every penny, every cent from Bravo. And I can't wait to see it just cascade downwards. I think that's definitely what needs to happen. I think this whole network has this thing where it just brings out the the misogyny. The Can I say the R word, the racist? Can I say that? Yeah, you can say racist, yeah. I think it brings out the racism in the community. Like, if you see some of the comments on, mm -hmm. on Twitter and in YouTube, there's just so much ism and and, and obic stuff happening. And I, I just, I can't. I can't. I think it's something with this network. Mm -hmm. That's my spiel. <laughs> no, it's good. No, I loved it. I definitely, just to, just to go back to um, what you're saying about the whole like drinking when I had my like Tourette's outburst, but I was <laughs> like, but I was just agreeing so hard because like right when you said it, the memory of that was dawning on me. And just thinking about that, there's absolutely no chance in hell that they should not be held liable. Like, like you said, it's their employer. It's just, it's just like in every other circumstance, a person who serves, provides, um, in those circumstances are always responsible. So how are they avoiding that unless they're putting that in specifically their contract, which is definitely sketchy and should be looked into because yeah. the whole thing is surrounding about alcohol, but yet you're, you're um, eliminating their liability from any mm. kind of like, so that would be, I don't know. Yeah. I, agree. I think it's also yeah. kind of like enter at your own risk, participate at your own risk. And I think they probably have that in the contracts. You know? But yeah. then they create yeah. an environment where they almost present like your job is reliant on that. Yeah. So like yeah, I can they, see yeah. what they're saying. So it's like a yeah. weird gray area. 
No, very weird. Because you're right. Their jobs do rely on it. If you're one of those personalities that you need to drink or do other substances to kind of break out of your shell. Yeah, yeah they hang your job over your head. And I don't think that's right because that, Mm-mm. of course, is going to compel the employee to, quote unquote, perform. So I, they're still responsible for that. Like, you can just hang somebody's job over their head because they're boring. And then you encourage them to do whatever. Because I remember when Heather, you remember Heather from Real Housewives of New York? She was on for like three seasons or whatever. She came back and she was like, oh, they're over there doing, you know illicit G-R-U-G-S, <laughs> you know, and who knows if if a producer supplied that or not, allegedly, in my opinion, I don't know. Maybe they did, allegedly, in my opinion. I don't know. Right, she was airing them out. You know what it is, though, yes. too? Mm-hmm. It's, I guess, for me, when it comes to that, I think the talent needs to really know that who they are can can carry them on the show. Because if you look at, you know, look at Candy. She is the longest standing housewife, and Candy does not drink. That's true. Mm-hmm. So, well, how long has she been not <laughs> drinking? I never even realized that. Candy never drink. Really? Yeah, Candy. No, she doesn't drink. Candy, Candy mm. doesn't drink. I mean, maybe she has like a glass here or two, but Candy's not a drinker, and that's mm. like known. It's known she doesn't drink, and she's the longest standing housewife. I think what happens is, like a, again, because it's a reality show. Think about how we interact as human beings. I think a lot of times when we feel pressure to perform or pressure to be on, if we think that who we are is not enough, we will turn to, well, let's drink. Oh my God, I have anxiety. Let's do some shots. You know, let's drink. Let's, you know, let's whoop it up. You know, you got to turn it up. So I think a lot of times the, the they equate being entertaining or giving with I need to be wasted in order to show up and in order to perform. And then, of course, you get these crazy things that ensue. But when you have people who know that I can just show up and be like, Garcelle shows up, she drinks, but she never gets wasted. And she's totally right. a vibe, you know, <laughs> even 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 like at Mimi. Nini never has a problem with alcohol. She drinks and she shows up and she's a complete vibe. So I yeah. think it depends on and the I, person. I also who, think a lot of those women don't eat. For them to be that thin mm-hmm. on camera, they're not eating. They're not eating throughout the whole season. They're barely eating. You know, they and everyone knows when you're that thin, yeah. And drinking, thin, yeah. And drinking, yeah. You don't hold a lot of alcohol. No. It's, it's very unlikely that you're like you have a high tolerance in that case. Um, yeah, it's just, especially with, um, what's her name from Miami? Marisol? Who had the, Marisol. Like, she, she, I even talked about, it. she's like, yeah, I skipped lunch so I could drink. I think Marisol has a ED and a, so do I. a situation a with her, with a disorders. certain relationship to alcohol. So do I. Yeah. Yo, what does ED stand for? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Eating oh, D. Oh. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think a lot. I was of them thinking erectile D. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Actually, that's, that's probably one too. No, they're just, they're just on hormones. I'm like, wait, that's not adding up with Marcella though. <laughs> they're, just, they're just on hormones, guys. That's it. It's just hormones. Yeah. It. Well, Hormone. what's her name is on testosterone, so well she was. Oh. Our girl, whoever, Blondie. What's her name? Mm-hmm. Southern Belle. But why can't I think of her name? I always go blank. Tinsley? No, on Beverly Hills. Sutton? Oh, um, yeah, Sutton. I love Wait, Sutton. Wait, what about Sutton? <laughs> I was just, it was just like a stupid joke because you were talking about hormones. I was like, well, she was on testosterone and then I like forgot her name. Oh, and yeah, then everyone yeah. was like, it was like crickets. So I was like, oh God. <laughs> oh, wait, did she say that on the show? Yeah, she was on testosterone. That's why she got extra sassy last season. Really? I have to rewatch. I haven't rewatched like a house. She's like, y'all, I'm on testosterone. And then you saw her kind of like going in on <laughs> Diana and everyone. Yeah. Well, this has and to I was like, and we were all like, yes, well, testosterone. Yeah. But now I think she's off it and she's gone soft again and talking about being a boss lady. It's, it's I don't good know. for menopause, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It helps mm-hmm. balance out your estrogen, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Adam. Hi, Candy. Hi, Natasha. Hi, everyone. Hello. What's up, Adam? Hello. I'm good. I'm good. So, so yeah, this is a mess. This whole, <laughs> this whole, this whole, this whole, this whole thing is a mess. I mean, everything you said about Leah Candy, I 100 percent it. Like that. I mean, she was a mess. I mean, that 
that last season of of New York was just all over the place. There was just no connection or chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, but I'm I maybe it's an unpopular opinion here, but I hated the revamp as well. Like that wasn't worth my time. <laughs> no, I agree. I think it was really boring and flat. I mean, you have all these people online that keep telling me that that Jessel was like as good as Lisa Vanderpump, and I, I find that a bit of a reach. Not. I find oh, that a bit of a reach no. because, like, blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but but I I don't know. I just didn't like it at all. Uh, it was hard to watch, and as you said, why are are these people making being single a storyline if you are scared for something to come out? Like, it's it's just fake. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe their spouses didn't want them to know, but maybe they could have came on the show and said, hey, I have someone, but they don't want to be on the show. Exactly. But, but has anyone else done that before? I think someone else. I think Phaedra did that. Yes, possibly. Um, but, but I kind of, my attitude with that, though, is that you shouldn't, uh, even though it's not them as such as a choice, you shouldn't go on a reality show if you're not going to show the person. You, you know, as uh, with Vanderpump Rules, everyone was, you know, who was this person Lala was with? You know, everyone would catch on going nonstop. Who was this person? You know, why can't you show him? Why can't you know? There was all all the all these people, you know, saying you're not showing your full life. Why are you here? And and um. I don't know, uh, but with with all these people on this that you've got on the screen, I I don't really like a uh, aside from Nini. Glasses. I don't aside aside, aside from Nini. I don't really like the rest of them. <laughs> but but the problem with Nini though know, is that she she just got a bit too greedy. I mean, she um. On her last three seasons, she was on 2.85. I mean, there was all these reports saying that she said she deserved to have matched Kim Kardashian with her salary, and that was just never going to happen. Uh, you know, 2.85 million a year is chill. You know, I don't see. What, I, I just agree. think you, you. You know, she was she was never going to get Kim K's salary match, and Bravo isn't as. Um, I mean, I mean. You know, with with E, I U of E, many years ago because we've had it in the UK. We don't have Bravo in the UK. We use this streaming service called Hey You, um, which which is owned by NBC. It's like the equivalent of Peacock. Um, so so we could never uh, get it back on cable in the day. Um, but you know, um, but but what's her name? Epic. Ebony K. Williams, I, I didn't like her at all. You don't like Ebony, mm -hmm. you said? No, I don't. I don't. I, I felt that she wasn't honest. She, um, in, in a lot of her interviews when she was on that season 13, she was saying, you know, I, oh, I'm um, a big shot at Revolt TV. You know, I'm, I'm Kiki with Diddy. You know, and, and uh, <laughs> to, 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 to me, to, to me I, 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 you know, to, I, I just found her someone, and also, also as Candy said, just uncomfortable to watch. You know, it was constant. A little bit. I agree with that a little bit. I think that she just couldn't take off her lawyer hat. Like, she couldn't yeah. be her lawyer. It was that teacher condescending voice for me all the time. You know? And I'm just like, I don't know. She's just She just wasn't likable. Does that mean that she's not right in everything you said? Yeah, that could be right too, but like, I'm still allowed to like not like her personality, you know? Yeah, a hundred, a hundred percent. I mean, I mean, it's a, it, I mean, but there's people on air like um, Candace and Potomac and Kyle and Beverly Hills that that you know are hard to like. I mean, you know, you had Candace trying to be in Giselle's good books on the Monique, uh, let's tear that to her down train. Yet two seasons later, um, Giselle, funny enough, comes for Candace's hobo looking husband. You, know? <laughs> you hate him. Yeah. No, Adam, Adam notoriously hates him and he thinks he's the worst dresser. But he looks he looks like a hobo. But to be fair, I'm grew up in Maryland and that's how Maryland straight dudes dress. Like it's just true. 
They're oh, not great dressers. That's tragic. And, and and he doesn't care about himself. I mean, the 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 whole facial hair is a mess. I mean, he just doesn't care about himself. Um, do you guys feel like Bethany is doing too much? Yes. <laughs> I do not. I, I stand behind her. Go oh, get him, Bethany. Name. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> and I haven't always I loved Bethany. That. I always felt like Bethany was very much a bully, but I feel like right now she's really trying to right her wrongs. Like, she has even, I don't know if y'all know, but she's even said that she's even kind of stood up for Kelly Ben Simone, where, you know, the whole Scary Island thing is concerned, and she did oh, really? blame some of that on pr production. Yeah, I forgot exactly Did what she, she blame said. herself? Did she happen to um, admit what she said at that reunion that day? Because that was pretty brutal. It was pretty hard to listen. I forget exactly what she said, but she she acknowledged that there was some wrongdoing there. But I agree. What she said at the reunion, a lot of stuff that she said at the reunion, it was just like bully stuff. She was being a bully, in my opinion. That's, that's what I mean. Like, we, I just need her. Like, I think she is doing great. I totally agree. But, like, on the other hand, for me to, for us to, like, put put all our eggs in her basket and be like, yes, go, Bethany. We just need her to acknowledge that she also did participate. And, like, we're not getting that, that much. She's kind of, like, putting the blame on other things, acknowledging that it happened. But she's not full out saying, yeah, I said some messed up things, too. Like, well, that I, performance I, interview I, with I her with and Natasha. Rachel. I agree with, with Natasha. With it it well, feels it, a bit vengeful. It seems like Bethany... I like Bethany a lot. I'm a fan of hers. I just feel like she seems like she has a bone to pick for Bravo. Um, what do you think and, about her whole statement where she said she never needed the show and Skinny Girl would still be the success it is today if it wasn't for the it That's insane the because she was no, on she was on and Watch it, What Happens Live thanking the ground that um, Andy walked on being like, you did this for me, you did this, like, Thank you. Like, uh, like it's it's ridiculous. This is what he, I think happened. And and then Jacob, I want you to join. Hey Jacob. Hey Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Hi. I think um, to Rena's questions, or Rena's questions, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I'm sorry if I'm not about Bethany. I think I think Bethany was bored. I think she was missing <laughs> the spotlight. I do. I think she had all this money, but no project that was actually landing anywhere. Um, that's why she did the Rewives podcast. I think she was feeling salty with Andy Cohen because he kind of like was shading her and not really helping her get back on Bravo. I think she was feeling salty because Bravo and NBC did not pick up whatever show she was pitching about Connecticut moms or whatever it was. I think she was bored and yeah. entered the Sandoval chat without all of the facts, put her foot in her mouth, and now all of this has been a bunch of damage control. But I'm not mad at it because I do think it's a conversation that needs to be had. And I think yeah. Bethany has the money, Bethany has the resources, and Bethany clearly has the time. <laughs> yes. So no, I no, no, you're right. You're that. right. And but I do agree that what's the 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 piece that's really missing from making all of this click together is the accountability of I see how messed up this situation is. And I'm gonna take full responsibility of how I contributed to that mess. Well, she, I think she has said that. She, she has touched on it briefly with me, but not it, but as much. She hasn't really. Yeah, yeah not but, really. Yeah. But she like tiptoed around it. Yeah. I don't think she will ever take full She stuck her pinky toe in it she and then, like popped it out real quick. And even in the quote in Vanity Fair <laughs> that I had to read twice. She said that these are people I would never give the time of day to. These are people that I, you know, didn't respect their past. But you know what? They've been thrown out like trash. So let's help them. Yeah, that was that. the quote. I read wow. it twice. I was like, excuse me, miss? You got <laughs> You're like, I need to read this twice. <laughs> Were you literally have the audacity to say these are people I would not give the time of day to? That's outrageous. Come on. I, 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 I like Bethany, like I said. Um. I, I like feel as though she's trying to. <laughs> What'd you say? I do. You like her too? I do like Bethany. Yeah. yeah. See, for me, like, I, like <laughs> I do like too. Wow. Yeah. I, I do. <laughs> I actually really like Bethany, but I'm going to call no. her on her staff. Yeah. 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 I just feel like she's pulling kind of a bit of a power card. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels like this is very power motivated. That's just, that's just how I feel. And I feel like you don't necessarily bite the hand that fed you. Um, that's uh, you know, 
not the kind of I think you can if the hand that fed you just smacked you across the face right after they fed you. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's details I'm sure that we don't know. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know. And True. there's mm-hmm. a lot. So yeah. it might be very much justified. I mean, but do, but none of you do believe her when she says that she still would be worth this amount of money that she was is now absolutely, without the shoe. Absolutely not. That's a bold faced lie. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, like girl. <laughs> Did she actually say that? Lie. Yes. On, she now. said she she said it's she like, was still sweetie, have... come on. We're here for this, but like come on. I, I mean she she said it quite a few times because she she not only said it on her on her podcast thing, but she also said it when she was a guest appearance on um, Shark Tank. The thing is, when your success <laughs> is so heavily tied to this show, it's really hard to now be like in another bizarro universe dimension. I would still be this rich without this show. Like, girl, stop. That's just not true. Yeah, it's absolutely to be just not true. With you, Andy Cohen wouldn't be Andy Cohen without the real exactly. It, it could we <laughs> could apply this to everyone, but like that's fine. To- much apply this to everybody and like i'm sorry bethany i think you're really smart you're a great businesswoman but like it's a little delusional to say that skinny girl would be skinny girl if you were for not if it were not for the show in particular because luann was the one who named the company skinny girl was luann's idea oh yeah Remember when Luann was like, you should at least g- gave me some money or bought me a car because the name Skinny Girl came from Luann. <laughs> so how would you have Skinny Girl without the show oh. and you met Luann on the show and she's the one who named your company? And you trash that lady the most. And you, <laughs> yeah. She goes in on Luann. Like, That's no, true. That's that true. Like, so much favoritism by mm-hmm. who gets a spinoff. This, that's just pure, like, how Luann and Sonia had a spinoff. Um, how Kim had a spinoff. Yeah, we had a spinoff. Mm-hmm. Wait, did you guys ever watch that Kim Zolciak spinoff family show? Thing? <laughs> uh, I didn't. I don't know I who did. was. Absolutely not. I watched it once. <laughs> it wasn't I, I'm not gonna lie. Like, if it came on before something else, I'd watch it. But it wasn't something I tuned in. Okay, because yeah. it. Uh, I don't know. It sounds weird. But but with with New York, as we've kind of mutually agreed that the spinoff was a bit, um, that the revamp was a bit all over the place. What is like the future? I think of I the wanted show? it to be good, and I might have said it was good, but now in retrospect, it was kind of like womp womp. What 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 is the future of, of the show though? Because 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 like everything is just all over the place. They I mean, they're gonna have back. to give they're gonna have to give it another season because you can't just drop it after one. Everyone has to come back. Yeah, they all gotta. Now that they, that now that we blew the lid off of all their lies, now they have to come back. And we're like, now you're going to come to work for real, for real. Yeah, uh huh. They. Have I feel to like come they're back. all scared to be mean girls. Like they don't want to get down and dirty. That is true. They all like kind of tiptoe around and kind of back off, and they're like, I don't want to mm-hmm. get canceled. It's like this weird. You could tell they all have this weird hesitation, and yeah. they're like all in that group chat that they talk about, and they're all like, okay, we're we're, we're going to get over this. We're not going to like cuss well, each other I think out. The producers told them to lighten it up after that girl had to get kicked off the show. I think producers were like, no, 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 this isn't going to happen. Real this and in. I think that they yeah. were like, you have to make this lighter like you have to so i think that's why they were maybe afraid who, <laughs> super who, 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 who on the re- revamp did you guys feel was the most authentic <sighs> I, I watched the season and i don't feel like i know any of them i think Probably aaron was aaron. the most i think aaron was the most authentic but she was but that doesn't mean that she was the most interesting yes, she was boring she was boring but i think yeah. she was the most real but she was still boring be- mm. Like okay. I can't even form an opinion because I don't even know them. That's how little I feel oh, like. True, true. I watched it, but like I, I genuinely don't feel like I know them. I That's feel like we I'm got saying. this weird facade, and so for me to have like a strong opinion, it feels weird because it doesn't seem like I have enough information. That's why I'm saying Aaron's the most authentic because I think she l- lied the least about her actual life. Yeah, that, yeah. that's where she yeah. went. She yeah. just lied the least. She lied the least about her actual <laughs> life. You know? Like, that's crazy. Yeah, like, I mean, that's what, what, what a he, great bar. That's right. what authenticity is. is that's like, where we're at, guys. Authenticity is just the truth of who you are. It doesn't mean you're interesting. 
100. It just means the truth of who you are. And I think she was the most honest. <laughs> but, but like applaud, I guess. Yeah. You know? You get the blue ribbon, but yeah. She just, yeah, she wasn't that interesting. I don't like really have an opinion on her either. I'm just like, okay, yeah, you're there. I don't <laughs> dislike you. I don't, I'm not like, I'm, well, I don't really like super fan of anyone, but like, you know. I, I think they just had a difficult task because they did film a lot with that one lady and they had to basically cut all of it out and start the first episode on this cheese fiasco, which was right. so anticlimactic. <laughs> So, I mean, and they knew the audience season. was going to feel weird because they were the new guys and they were replacing mm -hmm. our beloveds. Yes. <laughs> Used to be the thing I found weird, weird was right. that, that Jessel girl was like, Rebecca's an up and coming area, isn't it? Because that girl don't live in no New York, please. She does please. not know. I know, Jacob, tell him. But wait a minute. Did you guys? I, I, I obviously just joined and I, for the past hour, I'll be on this nonsense work call. But did you guys talk about the reunion part? Yeah, two? how it got canceled. Oh, no. We, I haven't the, watched when it. Yet. Said, when Bryn said, I'm black, I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, I was like, wait a minute. What? I haven't okay. seen the reunion yet. Yeah, I watched it. I today. had the it same reaction. Good. I was like, thing. excuse me. Now, look, look. That, we ain't going to be doing do, do, do too much playing. Just because your play hair is a little wavy, a little, a little <laughs> thicker. I was just like, Brent, please do not. Like, people don't even want to say Robin is black. I'm like, Brent, <laughs> a black woman? I I'll, Oh, okay, sure. I, like, I get it. Uh, but yeah, like, girl, like, you're people looking at you, like, would not know that. Yeah, and but, see what that says. Let, let's yeah. look. Right. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. Wait, <laughs> just a serious question: Is is the reunion even worth watching? Um. It is. Well. I think it is. Oh. Oh. All right. I think <laughs> it, they got it, a little spicy okay. towards the end, and it was cute. You should watch it. Come on, Adam. Support. They, got. They got to conclude it. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't get down and dirty. They didn't get dramatic. Uva. I think Uva served the most during the reunion. Oh God, Uba! I, I, I don't, I don't like her. She's just yeah, too Lord help her. us. Yeah, I already, we already talked about how Uba and um, Jenna Lyons um, had their whole character pretending to be um, single, and that was like their whole storyline. Come yeah. to find out, that wasn't them entirely. And y'all know how I feel about lying, so. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's just if it's her sense of humor or just how she is, but she always gives some dead analogy in her shade. I don't really understand why. Like Uber? Uh, yeah. Uh, what is it? But, a cultural thing. I think, but, Maybe. But I, agree it with exactly. I think it's just like her cultural thing. Like, yeah, for sure. Because, like, she did give, like, an analogy on, like, the last part of the reunion. Because, like, Andy was like, oh, it feels like you took a, a dump or whatever. And then she was like, no, it feels like I... She said something, and I did not know what she meant. So I think it is just, like, <laughs> cultural. Like a cultural I probably point. turned it off by then, so I, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it was at the very end. It was you're like, like yeah, I, I left the room. Turned, turned it off. A after that black thing, I was like, all right. You're like, bye. Now, now we're doing too much. We were doing way too much. Uh, are you guys enjoying Beverly Hills? I forgot Just it aired. <laughs> Beverly Hills feels like a soap opera. It feels yeah. like Days of Our Lives. Yeah. Yeah. Without Lisa Renna. Right? Thank goodness. Do you, I know. Do you think, do you think you're going to miss Renna or not? No, I do not know existed. I think that. Um, I have a feeling that this season of Beverly Hills is going to surprise us in a good way. I think it's going to be better than we think it is. Probably. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot real happening. Like, we got two possible divorces of people that we didn't see coming. A quote-unquote robbery, please. Oh, Not God. another one. There's another one? I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, Somebody I mean, some money. Wait. I mean, we, we've involved in guess who? Mm. I'm done, uh, Mr. I Reed Kensley. I mean, I mean, we, we, with PK. I mean, he, he has, he just has no credibility. I mean, he used to, he used to have so much money. It, he, it was unreal. He used to be the chairman of Tottenham Hotspurs, which is a massive football team over here. And oh, he really? He owned them? Yeah, or he chairman. Had, he had, yeah, he had a, he had a part, part ownership. Yeah, and. 
And so oh, that's he, like big time. That's like owning like a major sports team yeah, over here. Yeah, it's like owning the the Dodgers or something the equivalent. Yeah, uh, but but and when it's refugee because he he used to be. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but uh, there's this billionaire in the UK called Lord Sugar. He used, it was and he was on the aid on The Apprentice, and then he got fired for a year. He got bankrupt, um, so he lost a job. And he recently did this um, property show, which got like the worst rations in the UK. Mm. Uh, he, he was meant to sell property in London, but instead he just sold property in the outskirts and like. Um, Kind oh yeah, he was going this. to do it with Mauricio for a hot second, yeah, and then that went out yeah, the but, window. Yeah, but but oh well, I mean, I wouldn't want to work with both of them, to be honest, because <laughs> Ma- because because oh, Mar- Mauricio, Mar- Mauricio screwed over his brother-in-law. I mean, he literally stole all the contacts from the Hilton Highlands. Well, forget that. He's trying to screw over the U.S. government. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Uh, I mean, wait, what? I mean, I mean. Mm. I mean, Wait, but, what what happened with that? What happened? That that's with the house. With the house. The thirty million dollar thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Because he was uh, supposed yeah. to sell it on behalf of the government, because the government ceased it from <gasps> that dictator. Not the dictator. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, you guys know the story. What in the soap opera? But, but, I know the story. We we talked about it the other day, y'all. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it was that. Well, um, it, there's so know. much going on. I just forget it all, honestly. <laughs> but, Beverly Hills feels well, so scripted to me. It, it, it is like the fact yeah. that we have to say dictator now. That's outrageous. <laughs> I mean, no, with, I, with, with so Beverly scripted. Hills, I'm a bit, I'm a bit apprehensive about the UB. I mean, she was literally only in the trailer for for five seconds. Like, I let, I literally actually went out of my way to time it on my iPhone because I was like, oh did we even see her? <laughs> did we, did we even see her? I mean. I mean, she and I don't know if Bravo like were like cutting corners or something, but we're not going to see her until episode six. What? Uh, well, I remember when wow. they were uh, talking uh, about filming that it said she came in late. Um, that's weird. So but, but, I don't know because because we saw because in in retrospect we both saw Denise in season nine and Crystal in season eleven, both in the first episode of the of the. Well, I remember when Catherine joined and she came in like episode ten. Yeah, was it really that late? I don't think it was that late. I don't think it was that late. Well, I mean, not ten, but it was late. Late. I was like, oh, we got another girl on here. It was so random. I want, I want to see uh, what's her name, Crystal, actually admit admit what she did because every single time that she (laughs) she she said Saturn was a racist, she basically did the implication, but wait, she did. She yeah, said she was a racist. Tossin. She basically no. Did, she said did she said she she insinuated. She goes something was said that was really dark. You know how she loves those vague dramatic yeah. I thought it was that, statements. That, that pool thing. It was the pool no, but thing. She, she, it was but like she never, yeah the she, the hot tub thing. Yeah. But, but when she was asked, what what did she say? She refuses to say it. And even in the recent episode of Beverly Hills, Sutton, you know, was saying I don't have the best history with her, um, yet her and Garcelle are throwing her something in Vegas, so clearly... I they know, and it, it is a little odd. Like, like yeah. to, but, to, but to me, I just think what she did to Sutton was a character assassination. I, I mean, I don't believe Sutton, you know, she she's... Because she... I, I don't know. I, I, I don't... But did, did yeah. you guys know about um, Sutch, Sutton's finances before it was exposed on the episode? I thought we been knew that, right? Yeah. 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 Sutton has like money for days. But yeah. but I think back to the Sutton Crystal thing, I think Crystal got caught in a corner and mm-hmm. she didn't know how to get out of it and she just put her foot in her mouth. I agree. Yeah. That's I don't think I don't think she had any malice towards Sutton, this mastermind, I'm gonna malign her. I think she got caught in a corner. She yeah. didn't know what to say. She was trying to be relevant, and then she, she said too to much. And then she put her yeah. foot in her mouth. She was trying to explain herself, and then she had to double down because she couldn't just say, "Yeah, I didn't know what the hell I was talking about." And I just, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, but she, she should it. own it. Someone should I own it if they do that. I mean, I think a, she did own it. She was over there crying with uh, yeah. uh Erica. I mean, and you over there crying with Erica and Rena. You know you messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Um, Natalie says, "What happened with Sutton's finances, girl? She makes three hundred to three hundred and fifty k a month. Three three point six million what a year. What is her husband doing? Three point six million a year. He he is he uh, the a management business. director at this firm called Pimco, which is an investment management fund. 
And they have two trillion dollars that they manage. Oh and, my god! And and uh, and, so and, he, yeah, but her he, little alimony is like stuff that he finds in so, his couch. So, right. so it's pretty. It, it's pr <laughs> probably. But, what? But it's like it's like the equivalent of someone being like the head head of Goldman Sachs, basically. Yeah. But that's but why she's I, off at buying horses and stuff. But aren't her kids? Oh grown? yeah, that, that was so that was so cool. It was just yeah, like, but yeah, her, I, I but her money is from spousal she's, support. She's and not getting child. spousal support, not child support. Oh, yeah. spousal. But no, because like when she, she has turned, a deal. Once, yeah, she has yeah. a deal. Probably she can get that for the rest of her life. Yeah, but, it's for the rest of her life. It's spousal. Yeah. It's nothing. It's not like in, um, included with the kids. I mean, three point six million. Three point six million a year. She did, I guess because she helped. I don't know. I guess there was an agreement between the two that she because she helped. I don't know if she helped with the business, but please, like, please. That's what she claims. She, she well, up. no. When you're married, you, when you're married, she raised the children. Money, Take you deserve the money because you raised those children and they aren't strung out. You deserve that money because of that. You oh, oh. <laughs> no, you're right. even if they didn't have children, she deserves. I mean, the she's money. got other. She's got other business acumen. I mean, she owns a timber company. Oh, she okay. does. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so that much. whether she helped with the business or not, whether she had kids or not, she deserves every single penny of it. Yeah, just simply because she was holding him down in the relationship as the wife prior because to the trillions. Because then, it, because then it's like, oh, say you're a woman who doesn't have children, do you then deserve nothing? Hmm. Yeah, you right. know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I think it. I think, and that's kind of why I didn't like her whole like. I'm strong enough. I want to show him I'm smart. I was like, why do you have anything to prove to him? Like, yeah, why do you care that you're enough? And you don't have to like prove your worthiness by going out there and like becoming a boss, babe. No, you were with this man for however long. He built this business up. You deserve every single penny of how much you make a month simply because your presence made him better. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think that's what makes you know? it so and endearing. Like the fact that she has... Been. So yeah, much I money, think, but she exactly. is like, oh, I want to prove myself to someone. Like, girl, you are, you're loaded. I think, I think she was just I, doing it for a storyline. I think she just wanted something mm -hmm. to say, but I think it actually would have been, just for me personally watching, I would have loved it if she just would have said, yeah, because she did say I deserve this. I have no problem with it, but I want to stand on my own, blah, blah, blah. I would like if she was just like, yeah, I earned every penny and I'm going to enjoy it. What? Period I mean, dot. Because blue. it's called the real housewives, yeah. not the real boss babes. I mean, is, is, her, is her store uh, wow. like popping mm -hmm. or like does no one care for it? I have no idea. Because Candy, Wait, you live over there. Do you go to Sutton's store? I mean, <laughs> I've, never, I've, I've never been to Sutton's store. Mm. And I've also been holed up in Palm Desert for like this year. Oh, true. Yeah, she's been hibernating. <laughs> I've seen a lot of like Heather McDonald's out here a lot. <laughs> Oh, okay. I mean, does any? I don't know. Have you do, really? Do people shop there? I've never been to her store, but when I... Because it's all about couture and stuff, but, but, uh, but what's it? Uh, Candy and Natasha, I both sent you a DM of Sutton's uh, <laughs> finances. Okay. Wait, what? Uh, there's this, uh, there was this Instagram uh, page back in 2021 that exposed all of Sushin's finances. Oh, I just okay. Sent, I, just, I just sent it to both Natasha and Candy. Mm -hmm. I see yeah. see, that's why Sutton was like, when she, when she Ooh, first look at this that, article. Love it. Mm -hmm. It's like a newspaper clip. When she first thought that Tom just Thomas Girardi was on the up and up or whatever and Erica's divorce, that's why Sutton was just like, I can give you the lawyers and the forensics accountants because Sutton knew how to get that money, right? But right. then Erica was like, oh, no, I'm good because Erica knew how dirty they were. So yeah, she's like, Erica I don't want that forensic. Want, <laughs> that's why Erica didn't want Sutton's help was because Erica was in on the heist. Okay. Right. You know oh, what I'm course. saying? And the whole, quote, separation yep. divorce was nothing but a sham. And Erica knew that they were doing this big Ponzi scheme. Because if it was real, hey, my friend is making 350 k a month. 
tell give me everybody's phone number email, give me all the accounts app, yeah instagram tiktok give me all their information right you're getting 350k a month out as soon as she said forensic she backed away slowly she backed away and that's why erica had such a problem with sutton because sutton was like well what like she because she accidentally <laughs> exposed her she exposed her <laughs> And yep. Erica is probably jealous because that's what You're Erica so wants. <laughs> but, but yeah, as you guys can see on the Instagram, she owns a timber company. She owns a baseball team. She has shares in every like BlackRock and Pimco of uh, 3.6 million a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and also, yeah. yeah, I remember, I don't know, like for sure. I just like, this is, this is like coming from the back of my memory of non- useless information mm -hmm. um i feel like she told a story at one point could be wrong again that you know she had gotten a finance um uh i forget what you call them but they kind of like help you organize your finances and plan for the future hey, a financial planner and um they they really helped like to utilize her out her incoming alimony in like to produce more income so she yeah so all these like random hidden um like timber like why would you think sutton owns like a timber which is literally like chopping wood like you know um <laughs> all right. and, wood. And, and, yeah she she did say that that during the forensic accounting phase during the divorce that's when she found out and she, she bought a lot of properties of i think she said i don't know she said she she really like she was like no i knew what i was doing and i really yeah i don't know i forget yeah, exactly yeah, she did. Yeah, the only thing of her that surprises the only thing that surprises me of her is that I would have thought she would have a bigger house. Because because Why? I, I don't even I mean, know where, where her house uh, is. Her house is on the main road. That's also the other weird thing. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> is it in Beverly Hills or is it in Bel Air? Bel Air. Oh, it's in Bel Air. Okay. But but even even so, I if I I wouldn't spend five five point five million on a house on the main road. That's just me. You want that long driveway? I I mean, like, what whatever's whatever's decent. I mean, uh, but but then again, we've got, got all these criminals. Um, I I use that in jest. Um, that choose to live in Encino. You've got Kyle, <laughs> Dorit, and 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 and, and this you girl, um, Anne Marie also lives in Encino. But, right, but I guess she lives a few houses down from Kyle. That's what yeah. She about. she lives on the same road. That they both. That. But, yeah, I feel like Katie made a joke about it should be called the Real Housewives of Encino at one point. Yeah, um, I, I, I mean the the thing that I don't quite understand is, I mean, with with Dorit, it's she doesn't own her whole house. We all know that mess. But 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 with that's both, why she has to both, get robbed every few months. <laughs> but, but but both of us, I mean, for example, with Kyle, I mean, you know, it's you know i get it if you wanted to have more space and what have you but her house is worth 10 mil you know there's better locations for 10 mil it's a very historic house though i, 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 I yeah i can't remember who owned it Smokey robinson or well, okay name. yeah so i mean you know i, I guess it's an it's older history. historical home yeah and i mean whatever i wouldn't want i mean i wouldn't live in la period but um same i i think i i don't know i i prefer to be on the main road that's what i would like just because i'm more of a city person like city city not into the city suburbs. slicker right i mean, <laughs> it, uh, I mean well, in I london guess, in know, london like, yeah. in london we're like new york and and, and kind of, london's a bit more like east coast because uh right it uh, is. Uh, pe pe people don't you know every, people have cars but you don't drive to like the center of london it, like if you live in like the south of Manhattan, for example, you won't drive to Times Square or something like that. Right. But 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 I I mean in in London we I, I'm used to that metropolitan lifestyle and what have you. But like in London, it, it's seen as a taboo uh, to live on the main road. Like if you live right. on the main oh, road, yeah. You, you know, it's it's it is a different experience even for me to watch the West Coast shows because I'm just like I'm just not used to that. You me know, neither. everything being so spread out. I get it. Like most people in the world are like, oh, I want, you know, 10 acres. And Encino's where you get 10 acres versus, you know, half an acre in Bel Air, right? So, I, you know, that's like a status, right? To, to be hidden. 
Yeah, I mean, if you want acres in Bel Air, you've got to buy Jennifer Lopez's house. I mean, that's yeah, 34. Yeah. 34, yeah. <laughs> 34. You need a cool 50 mil at least. Uh, yeah, oh. 34 million is what it sold for two days ago. I saw. Oh, okay, wow. Mr. Real Estate. I forgot. But, but, He's got the Carfax and all the celeb houses. But, but, but I, I mean, I, are you um, guys excited for Potomac? No, I'm. I stand by what I said. I am just so done with them and what they put the, us through last year. And I'm stubborn enough to not watch them. I'll watch some recaps, but I'm not spending time watching Giselle and Robin do their shenanigans for the upteenth time and playing our faces like we're dumb. Like no, no, no. Yeah. How is Robin still here? I don't know. And I I'm said sure. why she has a job is an absolutely insane. Like it was an act, it was a joke last year. And now we're just supposed to pretend like that didn't happen. And the, this is like a real show. Like, no. I mean, <laughs> she basically is the NASA Potomac. Let's be real. I mean, I mean, absolutely. Uh, uh, I found and, it and, weird. And one of their scenes is them talking about their marriage again. It's, um, it's like literally playing in our faces. They're their like, marriage. hi. They're sitting there talking about their prenup or something. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, this is insane. And people were going to tune in and watch that again. Like, that never happened. Like, we don't know. It's all fake. It's insane. I have to watch I, just for Wendy. I can't watch for nobody else. Maybe Candace, but I have to tune in for my girl Wendy. But, um, oh, that's too wow, wow. Uh, you, you tune in for Karen, and that's it. Can, yeah, can, uh, Karen and Ashley for me. That's the two I like. Oh, Ashley, forehead. No, thank you. I, yeah, no. I mean, I, I mean, at least Ashley, at least Ashley delivered a wealth aspect. I mean, I mean, Karen with is her just... like war crime, like war <laughs> to come oh, to find God, out. Oh God, not that. Oh, well, <laughs> ex husbands. That is insane. I, I forgot about I, that. I, I mean, I, I mean, but I found it interesting in the trailer for the U season. The U girl calls her. Daddy a bad bitch. I found that funny. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, I it, see. I don't know. I don't even think I finished that that trailer because I was like, oh, yeah. Lord, the the, the U girl said her dad, um, her, her dad, um, like helps her get a two million dollar home. Oh, oh, the NECA lady, NECA. Yeah, the right. One, yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she, 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 she's the one that said that her dad, her dad's a bad bitch. It was quite odd. Oh, she said that. Dude. What in the yeah. world? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, is that is that like the lingo of denial and Potomac or East? You're like, I am I missing you something? That about is this your what father? the kids are saying? Absolutely not. <laughs> we don't say that in America. We, no. we don't say that. Mm -mm. I, I mean, you would literally get death stared if someone said that over here. Like, I mean, <laughs> we, we, we that's maybe definitely a new kid lingo. Except you don't use that to describe your father. What a yeah, I, that shouldn't be new kid. What lingo. a weird girl. <laughs> yeah, that's very strange. Oh, oh well. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we've seen Stranger, right? Right. <laughs> Stranger on that show. Oh Lord. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I mean, like I, with, 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 with Potomac, like I, I used to like it really much, but now I, it, it as that's a lot of us, I think. That's a I, I, lot of us. I, but I, I just think ever since Monique left, I just haven't loved it. I mean, I I just like the dynamic between Monique and Karen. I felt, you know, they those two were solid. They but, were cool. I think it's less of Monique being gone. And for well, at least for me, it was more when Mia came in. I was like, what is this? I mean, Mia, oh, oh my God. Like, like I, I couldn't believe that that girl was, even got onto the show. Like, you couldn't find anybody else? I mean, <laughs> like, there was no one else to catch. Like, really? This is who you chose? I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, I mean, are, are, are we going to see uh, Giselle's strap on house this season? Or? Oh lord! You know she's never going to be able to sell that house. I can tell you that right I, now. I mean, no the one house, find that. The house just looks like a strap on. I'm sorry, but like, yeah. it just looks like three, <laughs> um, like of those like oh, yeah. Amazon homes stuck together. <laughs> wait, she what the hell's didn't a, wait, what's the, wait, 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 what's the Amazon home? Like know. you know, like I don't know Amazon home, but you could like <laughs> buy those like shed type like miniature homes, and like it looks like, like she just like house? yeah, and she looks like she just stuck like three tiny homes together. 
but not in a good way, and then threw a pillar in the front and called it a day. Right. I mean, I mean, her ar- her architecture like loses license for life or something. Well, well she, she just doesn't I don't have taste. She, I don't think she hired an architect. I don't no. think she hired anybody. I think she just said. I think she hired a builder who builds with whatever is cheapest. You know, think like a uh, uh, Joe Gorga. You know, oh god, and, oh god, and, oh god, oh. and that house is not going to sell. When Candace called it a nine hundred thousand dollar teardown, she was correct. She it, was correct. I mean, Bethesda is a nice area, though. No, absolutely, absolutely. That's why that house was so nine nine hundred thousand, and the house was little. Yeah, that, it's so, because um, of the, it's the area and the property because Bethesda is a very nice it's, area. It's, it is. It is a. Very Isn't it meant to be an old money area? Yeah. Money. There's most, nothing. Most of those areas are. The, those, yeah, most those, of Montgomery those, County is um, considered are expensive. They are very. Montgomery expensive. County is like one of the wealthiest. Well, so is yeah. Annapolis uh, area in the, uh, in the country. It is. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what what Karen Huger said, which I found interesting, is that a lot of a lot of hers and Ray's friends like are people who live in like this DC and in like the nice areas like. Georgetown and what have you, and she said they would be perfect candidates for the show. I mean, I mean, they I don't. don't I, do I, I, I mean, I, I think Georgetown like just look. I mean, it's politi- It's no. But that it's area polit- isn't flashy. They're kind of like old money, and they're not like they're not trying to be on TV. Yeah. DC is a lot more conservative than other cities in America. Too. Yeah, they're not like they're not like very show busy kind of over there. It, they are. Wasn't that wasn't there a DC housewives that flopped or something? Yeah, it was a it was a well deranged. It because they they bypassed security and tried to bring cameras into the White House. It was kind of it it, they, it was a good show if you they, ask me. But. They they tried to bring cameras into the White House. Yeah, there was this deranged couple that um they're not together anymore and they were very flashy and they like bragged about getting into the White House when they weren't invited to like one of Obama's dinners or something at the time because this this was like oh, nice. ten years ago. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, but yeah, they, it's. I think that's a hard. It's probably a hard show to cast for, because again, it is a little more on the less showy side. Um, I think they all have difficulties casting each show for their own reasons. Like Atlanta's hard to cast for because everyone is dying to be on it, and they'll do anything and act the fool. You know, Beverly uh-huh. Hills is probably hard to cast for, pretty much for the same thing. Because I mean, I mean, the, Sa- the, Sa- to be on it. the the Sanya woman on Atlanta was the sleep until like. I mean, I didn't know she why was she was okay. Was a... I guess no, I, no. I wanted just to go to bed every time she came on. Oh well, mm, but, I don't know. But but I think out of all the franchise, the next show to get cancelled will be New Jersey. I mean. Like I, I'm just. I didn't even watch tired. the season. I'm, I'm sick just of it. sick and I'm just sick and tired of Teresa and Melissa. I mean, at the at the end of the day, you know, they the gotta do something the, different. I don't know what. But, but I was done I mean, with Atlanta and New Jersey this year. I didn't watch either one of them, and I didn't miss it. And didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't quite understand why they made Marlo a housewife because she would have still stayed if she was a friend of so they literally just promoted her and made a bad person probably because they couldn't find anybody else they probably couldn't find anybody else <laughs> yeah, honestly but she, but she literally would have stayed though if she was still a friend of like she would have not moved probably no there, there's no question about it she i mean she but i i mean like but as as candy was uh saying earlier um candy was saying that candy Burris, you know it's been the most long standing she she's not going to join at all this um take down bravo thing because like she she was saying that (laughs) she was saying that they could do a a reboot of of atlanta if they really wanted but she she said that a a reboot of atlanta would just be a flop in her eyes it probably would be um because people are way too like in the know of how I think most of they're these shows, yeah, the the people are just too in on the game, and it's impossible to be authentic now. And then and that that's all, why the, the producers shows. have to play tricks. True, like it's a, that's what I mean. It's like 
it's like all these circumstances just create this monster so you can't really point to one direction just to pull it back to the article it's like yeah it's like just everything all these ingredients mixed together to create this monster and so it's like you can't just point to one thing it's kind of like all of it right. and like where That's it's why come I look to at Bethany funny cuz i'm like okay you're going to be the champion for reality stars um but i'm just like you i mean i can't think of anything but i'm sure there's something that she's been involved in that was not you know well we that, were just saying how like dirty. when she was like being performative interviewing rachel and she was like repeating all the words that were said that she's like and my daughter and then like literally we could recap like four different scenes of her just like eviscerating her castmates verbally you know what mm. i mean and you're oh, just you like to her i didn't watch that mess oh my God. i was like well yeah i felt like i had to but like <laughs> i was too invested in that mess you know me but now i'm like Ugh. but yeah hey, like it? It, it was and so like we needed her like on some level to just like and and she did kind of like I said like she did kind of like dip her little pinky toe in it and like a little bit of accountability personal accountability not just shoving it to the nature of the show she was on like I want to hear her say I said some messed up stuff I That'd did that nice. yeah exa but she exactly hasn't. but she would never do that though I mean um, uh, what's it I was just I was just checking the live chat and one comment uh, caught my eye and. Uh, Natalia says, I love Potomac. Can't wait to see my favorite Giselle. <laughs> oh, stop it. <laughs> Natalia! <Giselle. I'm> just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, I think that if any, I guess if anyone were to be doing this sort of, you know, quote unquote reality reckoning, what up? I mean, I guess she's probably the best one to do it. And people are listening to her much more than they listen to Nini when she said basically the same stuff. Basically, and you know they're listening to yeah, that. But... more to listen to Mariah because Mariah tried saying it years and years ago. Um, but yeah, but know. the problem, but the problem with Nini, like I said, is that Nini just got a bit too greedy. I mean, you no, know, absolutely, she needed to go. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, the fact that there was a part of her and whatever lawyer or entertainment attorney that she hired to like negotiate her contract, thinking that she could match the Kardashian salary. That was oh, just... God, girl. <laughs> I, mean, that I was think just... another problem she had was um, people were, at least me, I don't, I, and I, I saw some <laughs> other comments as well, but yeah, it's people, me. I mean me. <laughs> I definitely when she was like, you know, it's 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 a racist environment, and I was like, well, you you sure stayed in that racist environment for a long time and got paid quite handsomely, and in my head, I'm kind of just like, you need to make a choice. Are you going to stay in this environment and suck it up? Because if you're going to suck it up, th th then be quiet. Or are you going to ditch it and really speak out against it? Like, I don't know. I can't get with the people who, like, stay for the benefit, get all the benefit they can. And then when there's no more benefit to get, now I'm going to bring it down because I had a horrible time there. And it's like... Now I, I don't know. I when when that happens, I look at them all funny. I'm like, okay, was it that bad? Like I like I believe everything she said to to be true, but I know that if I if that was me, I would have been done spoken up. I wouldn't have been on yeah. season four, five, six. Yeah, that's where you lose the credibility. Right. It's the fact you kept letting it go. And I understand that that could you could equivalent that to like an, any kind of abusive situation. So it's like a tough call to say. Mm. But I don't know. It just in this kind of circumstance, it does kind of lose a little. I don't know. It shouldn't, but it, it's it's. I don't know. It's weird. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, but it does, it's not as dramatic. I think people in the live chat are saying that if someone's not married, they shouldn't be cast at all. So that includes oh. like. Eh. I mean, what do you guys think about that? I mean, I they've care. been stopped doing that. Like, they've been, like... Well, the first Orange County had that girl. She wasn't married. Yeah. I mean, she was engaged. But, I mean, like... I don't Ooh, think jo it matters too much. Or whatever. Jo -Jo. I, just, I just want them to have something interesting to talk about or something real. I don't want no fakeness. Like I just don't want them to lie about them. Yeah. Right. This might sound harsh, but, like, I would prefer them actually having money over having to be married. Like, True. I... Like, I <laughs> 100, I 100. I can't take broke 
broke, broke, <laughs> broke, broke Monica on Salt Lake City. I can't. Are uh, we even mentioned her? her. Gina. Are we even oh, mentioned oh Monica? God, broke, yeah, I know. Broke, it's getting Gina. awkward with her. Like, I mean, too much. let Lisa complain about losing her ring. I'm sorry you can't afford it. Like, stop. I mean, I mean I'm, this is I'm real sorry. housewives. Like, she's I'm allowed sorry. to complain about that. I mean, this also, is what the show is. Just, and literally, the episode before, she was crying about how she went to buy the Louis Vuitton bag so she would fit in. So, who's really materialistic? You maxing out your credit card for a bag you can't afford because you want to pretend like you have money, or Lisa Barlow, who's crying oh. over a 68 diamond <laughs> ring. Like a good housewife should. Someone I mean, said Mon that bag right? was fake. Did you see that? I, I mean, I mean, I That's mean, Monica, messy, yeah. Monica is just. I mean, Monica makes Brandy Glanville seem somewhat better. I mean, oh, like no. as, 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 as hard I as that is to say, I, 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 no, I would because I've never spoken to my mother like that. Who That's true. That buckets. was pretty crazy. That was hard. I mean, I, I, I mean and Monica I, are two different buckets of crazy. Yeah, they're still they're two different buckets, but, buckets but, but 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 to yeah, speak they're to your mother like that, different ends of the. But just, that was just uncomfortable to to watch on a different degree. I mean, I've never spoken to my mother like that. I mean, you know, maybe if you want to be some attention seeker like the Cash Me Outside girl from Doctor Phil, but like oh, you know, but <laughs> but 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 but, but, to, but to me, like you know, complaining a, a, about wealth and and uh, what's I saw that Queens of Bravo posted this thing of how monica said on an instagram live that it's not classy for people like lisa to show their wealth off i mean what the hell have you oh, signed up for this is well, the show this I is mean, what the audience demands <laughs> right right I like think what monica show are you on back, girl like wrong audience bye mm -hmm. i like, think she'll be back next season though i think producers are very happy with with her performance. I also think because she's a plant. Like, she's going around saying all that stuff and the whole rumors about um, Angie's husband. I'm sure they're really happy with her because she's doing all the dirty work, but I personally don't want to watch <sighs> her because who aspires to be like her? I think a lot of fans like her. I think more fans Ooh, like her. I don't than really like her. I, mean, I, don't no, know. I don't like no. her. I feel like she has a sketchy kind of past. Yeah. She, who no, she no. worked with. Like her, her, her how she slept with her brother's so sister or brother's or sister's husband right. or whatever. I, I can't I, keep I, track. But it's her brother-in-law. Yeah, she had a she she had <laughs> sex with her brother-in-law. I mean, could you imagine? Yeah. The, but, 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 and then she's talking, and then she has like the nice. issue with her mom. But but to complain about wealth and saying that is tacky. I mean, like you know, if you know, some people you know are old-fashioned and don't like you money ways. But like you know, what show are you on? I mean. I mean, but the problem with Salt Lake City is that, is that it's just messy. I mean, all the Lisa Barlow haters are on a different planet or something. Like, you know, I, I, <laughs> I think I mean, Monica has an appeal to people who want like, to have sex I with their brother in law. As, yes. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> as per the storyline, like, yeah, if you, like, if you just watch the show per, like, just and take what they say as all the complete truth. Which I think more people do than don't. That <laughs> I can see how Monica comes across as like the winner of this season thus far. But for those who, you know, <sighs> I mean, a quick little Google search or a quick little, you know, just any little bit of insight will be like casual oh, click you know, click here. She's playing games. So I can uh, see it both both ways, and I, I do think I really do think that more fans like her than don't. I just uh, see her uh, as uh, a bit try hard. I don't like oh, her yeah. energy is a, just a little off for me. I don't know. She's she's not it for me personally. I mean, I can maybe see because she is stirring the pot and she is bringing up the rumors and the scandal. What but rumors, it's though, just because, like, mm. I mean. Like, do you, like the real rumors, like I'm like, what are you trying trying to bring up? Because I can't imagine that the because the real rumor isn't necessary. At least I don't really think the real rumor is, oh, the husband's cheating or likes men or anything like that. Like that's not. Oh, I believe it. Gonna, I, I, that's I gonna believe that's gonna bring the guys down. Not honest. I think it's more about her. You believe the rumor? Yeah, I, there's something about him, and I don't oh. know. But but, <laughs> but, but, 
but to 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 me, I don't like Andrea at all. I, I don't like her. I, I mean, think she's okay. I, I, aside from aside from Lisa Barlow, I mean, the rest of the cast are pretty mere. I'll give Meredith second place. I mean, Mary Crosby leaving, I, and then coming back. I don't know with her. It's, she's a bit all over the place. I mean. I guess her and Monica could be friends because I just need her to like read Heather some more and I'll be satisfied. What I really do think though, I think that this show, I, I, for a little while I was like, and then I gotta get off here and get ready to go to bed. But I was like, is this show going to stay on until Jen Shaw gets out? I think it could because I don't think she's going to stay for six full years or even five years because I think she got a year knocked off. I think she's going to be out sooner than we think, and she's going to be right back on. She the has screen. to get a year knocked off because she was in. Um, I think she got. She was in some type of class, like a program. program. Yeah. Oh. I can't remember. It's what like it was, college remember. credit. How you get in high school? Yeah. AP. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially with white collar criminals, they please. They negotiate they slice and dice those, Yeah, they slice and dice those sentences. Yeah. So yeah, I, think I she's always be thought out. in my mind and in my gut, I don't know why the number just three came to mind. And mm. I was like, no, it's minimum sentences. And I was like, okay, I don't know. So that's weird that you say that because I'm like, yeah. I think she's going to be out sooner than we think. I think season seven-ish, season eight, maybe. Oh. I think the big return. And, it's and yeah, she's going to be like, I'm there. back. Proud sh- yeah. Yeah, she's going to be like, I'm back to, to, you know, slay all of you who tried to, girl, please. The only thing I'm really looking forward to is, and do we have any tea on this? What is the conversation about that Heather is having in the opening teaser on the phone? Which is like, you guys. I have no idea. Oh, when they go to, on their trip? Yeah, I think, that's gonna be a, I think that's going to be a game changer. At least I hope if they are doing a big nothing burger, I'm going to be pissed. Yeah, <laughs> we can't we can't keep having those, Heather. Or, we like, can't yeah. keep having these Not nothing again. burger black eyes, Heather. No. <laughs> My mind immediately jumped to something about Jen. Me too. I, I don't know I what it I jumped to it something about Jen and Monica. That something's going to be exposed about that situation because she was like, I can't believe she like lied to us or did this to us. Maybe right. I think they've been sort of foreshadowing it's something to do with Meredith because she's like, well, I might as well do it. I'm accused of doing and you won't come back for this. But I think that's a bait and switch. I don't think it's going to have to do with Meredith. I think it's going to have to do with like Jen Shaw, Monica or something that comes out. And I think all of the girls are going to turn against Monica for some reason. Hmm. Wait, what does she? What I forget, like what? Because it's been a while since I've seen that clip. Yeah. Um. What does she say in the phone? Exactly. She says, "Like I can't so, believe they've done this to us, or they, or she, that or, she's done it to us." I can't believe that she's done this to us. Um. And she's on the phone, and she's like, "Are you kidding me?" And then producers try and come in, and she shuts the door, and she's like, "No, you guys, like not right now." And you could tell it's like really serious. And then, they, and then they um cut to when they're at. That now they're outside and it's like dark at some dinner and she's like you can't talk your way out of this one like I can't believe she did this to us and it was like you don't know who to trust and all this stuff like something yeah. goes down Monica like, goes down. Yeah, because Monica is closely Monica. tied to her like I think that's insane that, that no to Jen well duh of course she's yeah. attached to Jen she's well Monica to did also say like she keeps on, they keep on going back to Monica in her confessionals being like, yeah, you know, Jen told me all their secrets. Yeah, exactly. So maybe, exactly. If it'll, I guess, yeah. It, oh, uh, Lord, I think Monica. something, I think something's going to come out and it, they're teasing it's about Meredith, but I think, I think it's going to be something with Monica and Jen and Heather's going to find out and then something's going to pop off from there. And I mean, I just hate that Monica's like, fired. What they scammed Heather's grandma. That would be or something? amazing. <laughs> I just but wasn't fired. there something like um about at the toward the end of their filming and you know when Instagram was like, oh, they just finished filming and only one I, I can't remember who, but only one of them was talking to Monica at the time, right? Did anyone right. else remember reading right. that? Right. Who, I'm telling, who yeah, was I, that person that is talking to her? I can't remember who it, who it was. Oh well, then that sounds like it. Either. All signs are pointing think, in that direction. But I think the t- I think the tide's gonna turn on broke Monica. Mm, girl, 
Well, so will be like back next her. season. And I'm I don't like someone complaining like, about well. Tears. <laughs> You're like still pissed Crocodile off tears. about it. Be, because it stand, could. I can't stand Monica. I can't if, because the thing is, if damn. you're gonna fake cry, like, <laughs> at least continue the cry. Don't just like kind of cry and then stop and see if it's working and then cry again. <laughs> and like stop lying on your mother. Like stop lying on your mother. Put some respect on your mother's name. Yeah, that was outrageous. Like, that, that was hard was to outrageous. watch. And I just, to me, it's just so disgusting when people are disrespectful to their parents on and TV or, and or the elderly in general, it's disgusting. Yeah. like when Tom Sandoval was cussing out um, Katie's Maloney's mom. Remember when he was cussing out Katie Maloney's mom on Vanderpump Rules? That was yeah. disgusting. That was absolutely disgusting. No, like there's no redemption from that. You don't get on TV and clown your mother and disrespect her. Like I felt like, so bad. Like for her reel mother. it in. Like it she just so seems so unhinged. Way. Like she couldn't oh, control herself. I there was so nothing really right going on. And talk funny to my mom in any situation. Child, please. And her uh, mom was on TV and just trying to blend in. It seemed uh -huh. normal. And she was what? like, This is a betrayal. I'm like, you need to chill. Would you rather see Monica return? next season of salt lake or give crystal or some a uh, season 14. crystal a season 14 because she can just sit there oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh i love that answer i love that <laughs> jacob's ad libs crack me up <laughs> i don't know monica than crystal but i mean whatever <laughs> yeah I, I would do monica because crystal's like She's just there. Uh, like, she's a literal, just she's there. like the uh, furniture. Like, I don't know. Furniture. It's a, oh, it, wow. I mean. Furniture. It, rude. <laughs> oh. <know. laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, you guys. I'm going to get out of here. Yeah, I got to go. I'm going to listen back to the hour that I had Me to miss too. being on this thing. So I can hear the rest of that article. Because that article is a mess. That is insane. It is a mess. Yeah. It is I know. Thanks for breaking Thank it down, guys. Candy. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Candy. You gotta go. Thanks for having Love us. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Hey, take care. Thank you so much. I appreciate oh, you. Come up, I come up anytime. Candy. I loved your thoughts. Come up anytime. Candy, I also wanted to say I hope yeah. that I can see you on Bravo one day and you can replace oh. me. No, seriously. Your whole thing for the whole two and a half hours straight had me very alert awake focused it was extremely Aww. entertaining it was so good thank it was you so so, so good that that yeah, really, really warmed was. my heart that really like, like that means most, a lot you are the only youtube bravo celebrity person that i could say that i'm going to be hooked the whole time my full attention is going to be on you Aww. so no it's true it's great it's great so just keep it up and I hope I, I can see. Yeah, it's really good. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It really means a lot. It really does. It's true. All right, I'll talk to you later. Okay, bye, sweetheart. All right, bye. Yay, you guys, we did it. Shout out to my amazing panel. Thank you, Rena, Natasha, Adam, um, Sarah Content, Jacob, who else did we have up here? Everybody who came up, thank you so much. Shout out to my beautiful candy canes. Thank you for everybody in the chat holding me down. As always, be sure to subscribe, like, and share, and put your comments and your questions down below. Good night, everybody. Above all, be safe, take care of yourself, and I love you. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.